The story unfolds with Alkei Nishino, a high school student being woken up by her alarm. She appears to have slept off after a terrible night and doesn't look excited about the day ahead. While in the shower, Akain is seen crying. Akain Nishino opens the door of her home. A kind of bad memory is remembered by Nishino. The memory seemed to be an incident which recently occurred, the kind that took away part of her dignity. Her driver helps snap her out of this trance. She enters the car then gets driven over to school. On arrival at school, the students are seen paying close attention to her. Some exchange pleasantries with her while the rest just stare in amazement. Nishino seems to be a kind of popular student in the school. In the locker room, Nishino walks up to a boy whom she had been sitting close to for about three months now. The boy by the name of Sid. She exchanges greetings with him but gets frustrated when Sid gets her name wrong. She felt a type of disappointment and lack of self-worth. Nishino wastes no time in pointing out his flaws. Sid tries once more to get the name correctly but fails again. He tries to make up an excuse for not getting Nishino's name right. But this only makes Nishino angry as the excuse is a bit too stupid. Nishino already despised Sid, mostly due to the fact that they had been sitting together for some time now and he hadn't even once looked at her in the eye or even made eye contact. Also, due to the fact that Sid is quite average in grades and even in looks, he was exceedingly ordinary. Nishino, however, looks for a way to change the topic. Sid apologizes but still fails to get her name correctly. Nishino gives up and just tells him her name. The expression of frustration is written all over Nishino's face, but Sid doesn't even notice due to his concurrent lack of eye contact with Nishino. Later on, some students go over to meet Nishino. They are happy to know that Nishino will be playing the lead role in the upcoming night drama. Some tried to hype her, since the role meant Nishino would be more busy than she was the previous year. Nishino exclaims how nervous she is to be the lead actor and also how excited she was too. Nishino, at this point, had done everything humanely possible not to associate with Sid. She planned to ignore him totally. Nishino goes to the bathroom. There, she remembers some memories. The memories involved a series of things which led to her taking a break from show business and acting in middle school. All this was due to a scandal which made her keep a low profile throughout middle school. Sid, on the other hand, spends his time reading a book. It appears that something is obviously suspicious about him. While reading the book, he utters something about gaining more power. Close to the end of school, the teacher asks for a volunteer to tally up the school festival survey answers. Nishino shows interest but is turned down almost abruptly due to her already existing schedule and also due to the fact that she had a lot of makeup lessons that day too. The teacher turns her attention to Sid and asks if he would like to do the tallying. He gives a positive response and takes on the challenge. Meanwhile, Nishino is known for being both the teacher's pet and a popular student. The reason is to avoid hatred from everyone. She thought maybe being loved by everyone would reduce the chances of being targeted for wrongdoings. At least that's what she thought would happen if she lived her life that way. Sid plays the piano late at night in school. At that moment, some thugs on the street ambushed and captured Nishino's driver and beat him till he becomes unconscious. Later on, after a lot of attempts to reach the driver, Nishino finally decides to walk back home by herself. While walking, she came across an alley. The alley seemed rather too quiet. Suddenly, Nishino starts to feel that she is being watched. She could feel sudden movement and unrest in the alley. She then notices some movements which make her get frightened. In an attempt to run away from the already scary situation, she tries to find a way to escape. While trying to find an escape route, Nishino is caught by the same two thugs who took out her driver. They grab her in a sleeper hold, just before covering her mouth in an attempt to make her unconscious before taking her back to their hideout. Meanwhile, Sid had been following the thugs silently, watching their movements closely. He had been waiting for the right time to swing into action. Finally, Nishino becomes unconscious. The thugs then use this opportunity to take her to their hideout. Back at the hideout of the thugs, Nishino eventually wakes up. She is frightened and tries to scream but is told by the outsider to remain calm if she still wants to see her parents. The thugs made it known to Nishino that she had made a mistake by wandering the streets alone at night even after knowing her father's status in the town. One of the thugs, whose name was Outsider, happened to be an ex-military personnel. He tells Nishino that they have already sent a ransom message to her parents. The other thug seems to be more fascinated by Nishino's body than the ransom money. He approaches Nishino, reminding her of the last incident in which she was kidnapped and also got taken advantage of by one of her stalkers. Nishino tries to fight back but is overpowered by the thug. He tells Nishino that he would love to bring back the memories of the incident which happened after her first kidnap. The thug then tries to take advantage of Nishino. Sid, who had been watching throughout, wears a mask, gets a crowbar and makes an entrance into the hideout. The thug asks him to introduce himself. In response, Sid tells him that he goes by the name Stylish Ruffian Slayer. He then wastes no time in killing the thug who tried to take advantage of Nishino, and she is now left with Sid and the outsider. After some introduction, Sid agrees and accepts the challenge even though he knew that he was up against a military personnel. Sid shows his interest in finally fighting with the military personnel. 
he first starts to use the crowbar as a tango baton. Seeing that the crowbar wasn't working, he changed the style of the crowbar. This time, he used it as a regular club, the same way he had been using it while beating up motorcycle gangs. At the mention of motorcycle gangs, the outsider finds out that Sid wasn't a stylish ruffian slayer, but instead a balaclava berserker. Finally, Sid gets a chance to hit the military personnel. He continues hitting the outsider till he becomes lifeless. Then, he takes a knife which he uses to release Nishino from the ropes they use to tie her. After that, Sid leaves, but not before warning Nishino to be careful while going home next time. Also, he is not impressed with his fighting skills. He is disappointed that even a soldier was hard for him to bear. He could only imagine facing someone with more experience than a soldier and how the fight would end. Later, Nishino calls the police to come rescue her. Things looked hectic but after Nishino's dad pulled a few strings, the general public didn't get to find out what had happened that night. In the end, Nishino didn't get to discover who the stylish ruffian slayer was. Unknown to her, the stylish ruffian slayer is the same boy she despises in school the same one she had been trying to ignore and not associate with. If only she had known who it was, maybe she wouldn't have hated him so much. The next day, Nishino is rather happy going to school. She enters the locker room only to see Sid again. This time he greets her and gets her name correctly. And for the first time Nishino could see Sid look into her eyes. Later that day, a news headline was announced. The news was about an accident that had occurred on the city road which involved Sid, who was hit by a truck. He had died from a car accident. The police said that the driver wasn't looking at the road when it happened. An investigation was to take place to ascertain what really occurred. In a twisted turn of events, Sid is seen as a child who had a passion to be a superhero. Even he didn't know how it had started. All he knew was that he wanted to be a superhero by all means necessary. Like everybody's dream as kids to become superheroes, his was more than a dream. What made him different from other kids is that his passion is far more than just a temporary phase. Instead, it was like a fire burning deep inside his heart. The flame seemed to never die out. The flame, however, drove him forward. Sid did everything humanely possible to master every skill he could and become stronger. In school, the boy was ordinary and utterly harmless, but whenever he puts on the mask, Sid becomes something more special. Behind the mask he gave out all the training. As people around him grew up and passed the temporary phase of being a superhero, Sid instead grew more and more sentimental. He kept going, kept working and training even harder to one day live his dream because he knew that one day he would arrive there. It came a time when Sid had to face reality and know that none of the superhero lives meant anything. The world has a lot of combat arts and anyone on the planet could learn all of them. It was time to face the fact that the overwhelming powers he had been hearing about in the comics and stories wouldn't be possible to get. The highest he could do was just to fight a few criminals, but in a handicapped situation, a situation involving fully armed soldiers pointing guns at his head, Sid will have no choice than to give up. But if he becomes the strongest martial artist in the world, then maybe he may have a chance to defeat them all at once. His dream was to become so strong that even if a nuclear missile was to drop, he would be able to bind and hound his power in a way that he won't evaporate. Compromising wasn't an option when it came to the amount of power he wanted. Sid is seen having gained the powers of eminence in the shadow. He and his crew had become superheroes of the city. They are seen talking to each other about how they have completely surrounded the threat in the city at that time. The threat doesn't have anywhere to flee to or any place to run. The leader of the eminence and shadow assures them that it is exactly as they had predicted. They are left with nothing more than words of admiration for their foresight and meticulous planning. They were about to celebrate their first big hunt in a long time. Eminence in the shadow was excited and couldn't wait or waste much time. They waited for the leader to give orders on the next line of business to be conducted. Sid, on the other hand, was happy that the crew had done excellent work. Although he wasn't sure what exactly was excellent, he was still happy. Sid, after dying in his first life, was given a new one. And in this new life of his, in a new world, he is getting to live his childhood dream of being a hero. Not just a normal hero with skills, he was also given magic to add to those skills. Though he still isn't satisfied with himself and so needs more and more power. With the new added feature of magic at his disposal, combined with his already gained skills, he would end up being one of the greatest beings to ever walk the surface of the earth. Sid signals the rest of the eminence in the shadow. He tells them that there is a summit they all aim to reach, so they must go there and fast. This time, he is sure to make it or give up everything just to make it to the peak. He exclaims silently that he will give everything up just to get there, and that is how badly he wants to make it there. Sid didn't want to be the last boss or the hero, rather he wanted to be the one in the story who operates from the shadows, the one who shows everyone his greatness. The boy tells a lady that he doesn't remember how it all started, but as he can remember, he always wanted to be the eminence in the shadow. He calls the lady whose name is Alpha and she tells him that everything he said turned out to be true, and that she looked into those ancient texts, 
and found a description of what they believe to be the cult of Diablos. He tells him that it is what he suspected and the lady continues by saying the more they learn the more powerful they appear to be as he cuts in and tells her that they lurk in the shadows and hunt the shadow and that is what he wants and he will finally become the eminence in shadows, but the elf is a pushover. The police find a dead body in front of a van and examine it. It happened to be Minoru Kajino who, during the last summer of his high school career, was following the path to becoming the eminence of shadows when his journey seemed to be cut drastically short. He is reborn to a rich couple as the father rejoices, saying that the older sister, Claire, has always wanted a younger brother and will be so overjoyed to see one. The mother tells him that something is wrong, since the baby is not crying at all and the baby starts to cry and the mother concludes that she has been imagining things. Minoru thinks that he had no idea how or why this could have happened, but that's a minor deal, and more importantly, the air is filled with magical energy and in his past life magic was the stuff of dreams and fairy tales. But now he can claim this overwhelming power for his own and that's the only thing that matters. He was reborn as the son of Baron Kajnu, an aristocrat living out in the boonies and for generations. This family has pumped out Dark Knight's fencers that enhance their physical abilities using magic. And everyone has high hopes for the cage new heir which is not him but he is hiding in the shadow of his abundantly talented sister, and he grew up as the average, ordinary Dark Knight and training background character a later we see him fighting some bandits with his magical power after telling them to nicely hand over what they stole. But they refuse and this made him destroy them and he moves closer to take what they had stolen that is money, art, food. While examining them he sees a cage and moves closer to it thinking it's a slave but finds a body that is starting to rot, but still alive which means it's possessed feeling like he had feel that wavelength before like a magical overload he touches it saying he can use the blob since it not his body, and he can do anything he wants with it without hurting himself and after that he starts to shoot it up with magic and tries all kinds of things that didn't work in a period of exhilarating experimentation. Then, one month later, he finally succeeds in containing the magical overload, but the body turns out to be a lady. He becomes surprised that something that has decomposed could revert to normal. Not knowing what to do, he finally gets an idea and decides to stay sharp, since that is his first performance in the eminence in shadow. The lady wakes up surprised that he is alive. He tells her that he has broken the curse that was gnawing away at her and she is free now. She asks him which curse and he explains that it's a terrible curse that was cast on her and the other hero's descendants. He shows her a book which contains a fairy tale recorded in the scriptures about three heroes who defeated the demon Diablos and saved the world, and that the story is true, and that the demon, with his dying breath, cast a curse and that is what really turned her into that rotting lump of flesh. But someone has twisted history and turned her into objects of scorn calling her possessed and decides not to tell her who the person is saying it's too soon and might put her into great danger. But the lady insists that she no longer care and demands to know the name. He tells her it's the cult of Diablos a group of zealots who are plotting to revive the great demon and they never come out into the light of the day and his mission is to remain in the shadows, to put an end to their evil schemes and introduces himself as Shadow He who lurks in the shadows to hunt the shadows. He explains that his path is not an easy one and must fulfill his missions and tells the girl if she is prepared to walk his path with him. The lady tells him that she feels she lost everything, but since he saved him, she will make him do what he wishes and walk with him and punish the guilty. Meanwhile, he made the whole thing up and will probably be up against powerful government leaders and staff. She promises not to show mercy to anyone who stands in their path, and he accepts happily and calls their organization Shadow Garden and names her Alpha. Three years passed after he brilliantly ad-libbed his way through his first performance and he is now 13 years old, on average. Ordinary Dark Knight in training and the fencing in this world is unsophisticated since his past life. That is the age of information. He was able to fuse all kinds of martial arts together and optimize them. We see him fighting with his sister but she beats him up instead of believing he has not made any progress. A maid calls Claire, informing her that her mother is calling her, and the guests are arriving for her farewell party. Claire bids him goodbye and informs the maid to clean him up. Minoru believes he must play background character if he wants to be ready for the day he believes will come. At age 15, nobles must attend the Midgar Academy for Dark Knights in the royal capital. But the day of her sister's departure they can't find her. But since Alpha had collected members for the Shadow Garden, they start to find her. Eventually, they discover that she has been kidnapped by the Cult of Diablos, a high-ranking officer, and is one of their descendants. They take out a map and go that night to find her. She is being chained down somewhere he they attack, beating up the man who kidnapped her, but he escapes as they decide to split up. Minoru meets up with him, gives him a lesson and beats him up. Before dying, the kidnapper tells him that the darkness of the world is much deeper. He sees his daughter's pendant before dying and Minoru picks it up. This completes their mission. The next day, his sisters show up to their mansion in a pretty bad mood. She goes to her royal academy like nothing has happened and he wishes he can go also but he has to put the girls to work. 
However, they say their goodbyes to him as they decide to leave. Sid is on a train as he thinks about what the girls have earlier said about the cult of Diablos being an enormous organization running on a global scale. He finds this pretty impressive. This is due to the fact that they all had to scatter I order to fight against it. He, however, thinks they made up the story of the cult to be on their own. Realizing this, he doesn't blame them for coming to this conclusion, as he had made a decision like that while growing up. Remembering the time, he is left with a smile on his face. Just then, he is determined to keep striving to become the eminence in the shadow, even if it means he ends up becoming the last person in the world. Later on, Sid finds himself in the royal capital of the Midgar Kingdom. Then he stares at a tall beautiful building, and at that moment, he is reminded of the time when he was age 15 and was enrolled in the same school as his sister. The school was named the Midgar Academy for Dark Knights. He recounts that the school was made for promising students both within and outside the kingdom although he doubted how he was able to get in, since he considered himself a background character. Unfortunately, this has extended to his present life as they still treated him the same way. At that time, he had just woken up and gotten ready for school. Coming down the stairs, he sees his two closest friends, Skell and Poe, waiting for him. Seeing him, they both wondered what he had done to his hair, as it seemed different from the last time they met. However, they waste no time on the subject, since they are all in a hurry to catch the train to school. Fortunately, and after running for a while, they are able to get on the train, which happened to be almost filled up. While on the train, Sid complains that he wishes they would get a chance to live in the dorm like the upper-class students. However, his friends find this to be unrealistic, since the dorms are only preserved for royalty and its kind and not bottom-of-the-pile nobles like them. Hearing this, Sid is, however, optimistic that they will get a chance to live in the dorms if they get to be honor students like his sister, who had achieved that feat and got a chance to live in the dorms. To do this, they would have to be champions at the Bushin Festival. This, they find more unrealistic than living in the dorms. Shortly after, Sid is reminded of the bet he had made earlier with his friends. Apparently, they had agreed that whoever got the least score in their test would have to confess love to the most sought-after girl in the school, and suffer her brutal rejection. As much as Sid had always wanted to experience a background character event, he didn't find this to be pleasing at all. When the three of them arrive at school, they see the girl in question, the beautiful Princess Alexia being asked out by a boy kneeling and holding flowers, and in the presence of a group of students. The boy crafts his words and asks her out like a noble would, but shockingly, she turns him down, rejecting his proposal. Witnessing this, Sid's friends tell him not to get cold feet and are determined to see him go on with the bet. Sid, on the other hand, is very optimistic and ready to get this over with, since he is so sure that Princess Alexia will reject his proposal immediately. Later that day, he meets with her in the woods, while his friends are watching. Then, he pulls off the most awkward way of asking out a girl ever by stammering and looking very tensed. After asking her out, he waits for her to reject him as he assumes that he had just asked her out in the most background character style ever. To his greatest surprise, Princess Alexia accepts his proposal, saying she had been waiting for someone like him all this while. At that moment, he wasn't the only one that was shocked at Princess Alexia's acceptance, as his friends who had witnessed the whole of this were left speechless and shocked to their bones. Oh my god! The news about Sid being Princess Alexia's girlfriend spread around the school, and the students wondered just how he was able to pull it off. In the school's cafeteria, they all look at him in a weird way, and wonder how someone so average could be in a relationship with Alexia. Most of them conclude that it could be a mistake and not actually true. Meanwhile, Sid doesn't feel comfortable with this. While sitting with his friends, they further reiterate how unworthy he is to date Princess Alexia. However, Sid thinks she wouldn't have accepted his proposal if there wasn't a catch to it. Although his friends are not bothered about that and advise him to enjoy his time with her, seeing as she is someone every boy in the school had their eyes on. While they are talking, Princess Alexia comes to join them at their table. This further confirms the dating rumors going around. When she sits, she is offered a different meal from the students. Sid's friends imagine how she would be able to finish all that food. But she states that she never does and wouldn't mind having some of the food given to the lower class. Hearing this, Sid initiates what he calls Operation Dump Me already by dipping his chopsticks in her food and taking some pieces of it. Instead, she invites him to take a fencing class with her. Even though he has already attended such a class at the lower level of Section 9, she informs him of an opening in Section 1 which was originally meant for nobles and upperclassmen. On his first day of taking the class, he was given the breakdown of the class by Mr. Zenon, the instructor. For the first class, they are paired up and tasked with fencing against each other to determine their strokes and counterstrokes. Sid happened to be paired with his girlfriend, just as she had wanted. While fighting, he realizes that she is not as good at fencing as he had thought, and tries to replicate his moves hoping he was better. He thinks her style of fighting is basic and not interesting, since she seems to stick a lot to the basics. He realizes why her techniques are said to be inferior to those of her sister who is known throughout the kingdom as the most powerful Dark Knight. 
However, he commends her efforts in building herself from the basics one step at a time. After their fencing match, Princess Alexis thanks him for it and commends his fighting style. Although she states that she hates it because it looks so like her style. Sid, however, is left with no time to think about this as he sees Mr. Zenon confronts Princess Alexia about choosing him as a boyfriend. He thinks she is acting like a child and choosing Sid and trying to run away from him, especially since she had been betrothed to him. Later that day, Sid questions her about not wanting to get engaged to Mr. Zenon and using him as a means to escape, since he seemed like somebody she would easily control. He is insistent on not wanting to be caught up in her charade. Hearing this, she thinks they are cold words coming from her boyfriend and reveals to him that he is no better since he had approached her for the wrong reasons also. She tells him that she had found out from his friends that he had earlier approached her only because he lost a bet to them. She threatens him with reporting the case of the situation to the student body and making his days at the academy nothing close to peaceful. She urges him to continue acting as her boyfriend, at least until Mi Zenon leaves her alone. Although Sid doesn't think he will stop anytime soon, Princess Alexia remains optimistic as she seems to have a plan of her own. After much persuasion, Sid continues to be adamant, not until she brings out a golden coin and tosses it at him. At first, he tries to act cool and collected, asking if she thinks he can be bought so easily. Well, the answer happens to be yes since he wastes no time in picking up the coin. After that, she continues to toss coins at him and refers to him as her loyal dog, which he accepts. While acting out their boyfriend and girlfriend roles, Princess Alexia sees Mr. Zenon talking to two girls. Seeing this causes her to be angry as she walks fast past them. Mr. Zenon, on the other hand, is left with a smirk on his face after seeing her reaction. After school, the two board the train back, and Sid is bored from hearing Princess Alexia nag about Mr. Zenon's actions. He comes to the conclusion that she is a very prudent person in public but filled with insults on the inside. The two go to get ice cream and Sid wonders why she can't just cut the line since she is a princess, but she claims to act that way because she wants to announce their relationship to the world. Not like it's for a good reason though. While licking their ice cream, Sid remains curious and seeks to know why she refuses to marry someone as perfect as Mr. Zenon. In response, she claims to hate everything about his existence. Furthermore, she says that he only seems perfect on the outside, since that is likened to how she acts too. However, on the inside he would have a lot of flaws, although she finds it hard to figure out what exactly his flaws are. She claims to have nothing against Sid since he has proven to have a lot of flaws, which isn't the case with Mr. Zenon. On their way back, Princess Alexia, once again, commends his fencing and talks about how unique and mysterious it is. However, she still claims to hate it. In reply, Sid complains about her fencing being unusually aggressive and sloppy that day. In her defense, she tells him that she had always wanted to be as good as her sister and had trained herself from scratch to be where she is. However, her efforts seem to be in vain as compared to her sister. She is being called the fencer ordinaire. She comes to terms with this since Sid's fencing style is so similar to hers. Although he doesn't seem to care about any of that, and instead, commands her fencing style. Hearing this, causes Princess Alexia to draw her sword and point it at him. He, however, remains calm as she asks him what he means by telling her that. He informs her that he means nothing but only gets pissed when people speak badly about the things he likes, which in this case is her fencing style. Shortly after, they arrive at their destination and she bids him goodbye before alighting the train. With her departure, he assumes that this is the end of his unwanted relationship. The next day, Sid arrives at school with his friends and they apologize for revealing the secret of the bet to Princess Alexia. After forgiving them, they see Knights of the Night Order at the entrance of the school. Just then, the Knights approach them and inform Sid about the princess's sudden disappearance. Since he was the last person she had seen, they named him the prime suspect. At that moment, Sid realized just how much of trouble he was in. After some time has passed, Princess Alexia finds herself awoken in an unfamiliar room. She comes to the terrifying realization that she is in grave danger when she discovers that she is being held captive by magical chains. She looks about, but it does not appear that she is familiar with the location that she is now in. Then, she arrives at the conclusion that perhaps it had been the one who had done this to her. As she continues to look around, she comes across a hideous-looking beast with one eye that is also chained up. On the other hand, it appears that the creature was subjected to a significant amount of physically torturous procedures. Soon after that, a strange-looking man wearing a lab coat and beaming with joy because he had finally located royal blood walks in. Princess Alexia maintains her composure upon seeing him. He ignores her while he goes on a rant about how he has finally found royal blood, but she keeps trying to speak with him. Princess Alexia, who has noticed this, attempts to question him about his urgent need for her blood. In response, he tells her that her blood is demon blood, which can be utilized to resurrect demons in the modern-day world. 
Despite the fact that she is unaware of what he means by that, she thinks that it is lovely. On the other hand, the Night Order has Sid bound and tortured because they hold him accountable for the kidnapping of the princess. They believe he was the one who did it. They continue to torture him and interrogate him about this matter, but he does not provide the response that they are hoping to receive from him. They were getting frustrated with him, so they decided to step up the torture to try to get him to cooperate more. In order to accomplish this, they use lengthy claws that resemble needles to stab his thigh. This unquestionably gets him talking, and he screams at the top of his lungs that he has no idea where the princess is. After that, he implores them to spare his life and not put an end to his existence by killing him. They have no idea that he is just acting out the pain so that he can wait for the perfect opportunity to attack. In the meantime, back at the location where Princess Alexia has been held captive, she is under the impression that her sister should have begun searching for her by this point. Despite this, she anticipates that it should not take so much time. Despite this, the scary doctor continues to collect blood from her, and with each syringe, he shows more and more excitement. Right at that moment, Princess Alexia implores him not to take a significant amount of her blood because she is not yet prepared to die. In response, the doctor guarantees that he will not do so because he is eager to obtain a great deal more from her. The next time he tries to extract her blood, the needle is unable to puncture through his skin and remove the substance. The mere sight of it drives him to a state of extreme frustration and rage, which in turn prompts him to go on and on about how he has been unable to finish his research. He takes out his frustration on the strange-looking monster that is sitting next to Princess Alexia, by repeatedly stamping on the monster's head. Princess Alexia once more brings up the subject of his requirement to take some of her blood in an effort to dissuade him. This compels him to grab a bowl of rice and attempt to shove it down her mouth as she is resisting. He does this in an effort to raise her blood level back up, but Princess Alexia is not certain that this is in her best interest. At this very moment, the strange creature keeps a watchful eye. In the meantime, Mr. Zenon makes his way to see Princess Iris, who is Princess Alexia's sister. When she saw him, she gave him a compliment for his participation. On the other hand, Mr. Zenon claims that he believes he bears some responsibility for the incident because it occurred on the premises of the school. They both arrive to the same conclusion, which is that rescuing the princess ought to be their primary objective. However, despite the fact that Princess Iris has concluded, on the basis of the report that was presented to her, that Sid was to blame for the disappearance of the princess, Mr. Zenon informed her that there is no possibility that Sid could have defeated someone on the level of Princess Alexia. After hearing this, Princess Iris relates that he had remained silent throughout the five days that he had been held in jail. She is of the opinion that he ought to be set free but constantly watched afterward. Despite the fact that he agrees with her, Mr. Zenon continues to argue that Sid had nothing to do with the kidnapping of the princess. On the other hand, Princess Iris would prefer not to have to point the finger of guilt at the children who attend her sister's school for something of this nature. It is really upsetting to her that there is not enough help available to seek for her sister. Mr. Zenon tries to reassure her by telling her that she is not to blame for the situation and he also asks her if there is anything that he can do to assist her in any way. In response, she requests his assistance in preserving the established order at the academy. Claire, Sid's sister, is irritated by the fact that her brother was detained for a period of time. She insists that he be freed and begs to be let go so that she can rescue her brother, but he demands are ignored. At this same moment, Princess Iris is given reason to reflect about the disappearance of her sister. She reflects back on the few occasions when she was forced to spend time with her sister and recalls that they spent the entire time dueling with swords. It has been a very long time since the two of them have communicated. And now that she is lost, she is afraid that she will never get the chance to talk to her sister. On the other hand, Sid is finally freed after being held captive for a number of days. After being set free, he boards a train and travels back to his home. Sid, though, continues to be preoccupied with the idea of leaving the life of a background character, so he fights the temptation to get his wounds treated. He becomes aware that he was being followed after he looks around and sees some men who appear to be acting suspiciously. After he got off the train, the men continued to follow him, and shortly thereafter, a woman walked briefly by him while muttering to him to meet up with her later. When he finally gets back to his room later that day, he finds Alpha already waiting for him there. When he saw her, he was taken aback by the fact that she had shown up in place of Beta, who, according to his account, was supposed to be performing personal assistant duties. Exactly at that moment, she shares with him the latest information regarding their investigation into the cult of Diablos that they have been doing. She gives him her word that they will assist him in solving the issue of the princess kidnapping and requests that they be treated to a meal once the case has been resolved. After that, she asks what should be done to the two men who had tormented him in the past, but he believes that they are merely doing their job. 
However, because she has been given many plates of rice, the princess is now unable to speak because she is too weary. On that particular evening, Sid makes the decision to assume his shape as the eminence in the shadows. He hears word that a significant number of his personnel have gathered around the city and are prepared to carry out his orders as soon as he gives them. Right at that moment, he gives them orders to start simultaneous assaults on all of the cult of Diablo's hiding places that are dispersed over the capital. In the meantime, he instructs them to look for Princess Alexia, as they do so. The eminence in the shadows has everything in position and prepared for an all-out assault, and they are dead set on making sure that everyone is aware of their existence. First, he kills the two men who had been following him and then delivers their remains to the guards who had been torturing him. When they see him, they have no idea how powerful he actually is or how much he has tricked them by pretending to be incapable of doing anything. They are left with no time to live as he slices the last of their bodies, killing them as well and exacting a satisfying revenge on them. When Princess Iris witnesses everything that's going on, she can't help but wonder what's going on, but is more concerned about her sister's safety. The noise from the ruckus in the capital city reaches the room where Princess Alexia was locked up, and she reports that the loudness makes it difficult for her to sleep. A little while later, the doctor runs in, clearly shaken and in a hurry. Princess Alexia, on the other hand, thinks that an assault by the Night Order was the reason of the attacks. However, he states that he couldn't care less about them and that he would murder them all if he had the opportunity to do so. It would appear that something altogether else is what makes him feel uneasy. As a last-ditch effort, he injects the blood of Princess Alexia into the body of the monster that is standing next to her. It suddenly balloons into a much larger and more terrifying monster. While he is overcome with awe at the sight of what he believes to be his own creation, the monstrosity quickly puts an end to his joy by taking his life. After that, it unchains Princess Alexia and removes the rest of her restraints. This leads to her being perplexed as to why the monster would save her life in the first place. On the other hand, other citizens do not receive the same respect when the monster unveils itself to the world and gets ready to wreak devastation as it was intended to do when it was created. In the meantime, Princess Alexia has regained her freedom and is navigating her way through the wrecked corridors of the building. She comes upon Mr. Zenon when she is walking toward the facility, and she finds herself curious about the reason he is there. It comes as quite a surprise to her when he reveals to her that he is the owner of the facility, and was the one who had supported the doctor's research. The fact that the princess claims she has always known there was something wrong with her prince's head suggests that she is not shocked by this news. Nevertheless, he is unconcerned about what she thinks and is delighted to have her blood in him because, according to him, it will cause him to quit the ludicrous role he currently holds as a sword instructor. As the two argue with one another, Mr. Zenon instills in her the notion that she would never measure up to her sister's standards. After he has vanquished her, he is getting ready to carry her away when Sid appears and reveals himself to be the eminence hiding in the shadows. When Mr. Zenon sees Sid approaching him while disguised as the eminence in the shadow, he immediately recognizes Sid as the person who has been causing trouble in the city and tracking down members of the Diablo's cult. At that precise instant, Sid reveals his true identity to be Shadow, and says that he is the one who lurks in the darkness in order to hunt other shadows. The moment she hears his name, Princess Alexia's expression abruptly shifts to one of surprise. During this time, Mr. Zenon does not appear to respond in any way to his introduction. Sid, on the other hand, is mocked because he was only accountable for eliminating the dangling threads of the cult not the actual members of the cult themselves. In response, Sid assuages his fears by assuring him that the outcome of their hunt will remain the same no matter how many times they go on it. After that, Zenon issues a challenge to him, claiming that a core member of the cult is currently standing in front of him. Apparently, this member is Zenon. He threatens Sid with the ultimate goal of taking his life in the name of the Knights of Rounds. On the other hand, it appears as though Zenon has launched a particularly vicious assault on him as he charges at him. Surprisingly, he did not strike Sid, who had already moved out of the way and was now standing in front of Princess Alexia. Sid, as a way of subtly mocking him, asks to meet the alleged central member of the cult that he had been talking about, which causes him to be taken aback to the point of complete surprise. On the other hand, the knights are having a difficult time protecting the citizens from the enormous and lethal monster that managed to escape from the facility. They fire a number of rounds at the monster, but it seems as though their efforts will be in vain because the monster slaps them out of the way causing them to soar into the air as a result. They launch another attack at the beasts, this time executing a triple slash that cuts the monsters back in three places. On the other hand, in a turn of events that was completely unexpected, the monster is able to heal itself. As soon as the soldiers realize that the creature they are up against is not your typical monster, they are given the orders to assemble all of the units that are nearby, and to fight it with everything they have. In addition, now that the citizens have been evacuated, the knights have been given the order to cause damage to the structures if doing so ends up being necessary in their bid to defeat the monster. However, Princess Iris has recently arrived at the location, and upon her arrival, she wastes no time in beginning to slash the monster in preparation for the inevitable conclusion of the battle. 
Despite this, the monster is able to pull itself together and stand back up on its own two feet. As soon as the knights see this, they are astounded by the fact that the monster is still able to continue its assault in spite of Princess Iris having cut it. As a result of seeing this, Princess Iris becomes enraged and cuts off one of his arms with her sword. It did not appear that this was as fruitful as she had hoped it would be given that the monster almost immediately grew another arm after this. Princess Iris is not frightened or alarmed by the mere sight of this because it does not persuade her that she is in any kind of danger. Instead, she has grown more resolute and is now of the opinion that in order to get rid of him for good, she will need to dismember him and scatter his pieces around. Because she is going to continue to cause the monster more suffering if she keeps doing this, Alpha arrives just in time and is able to stop her. Upon first seeing the woman, Princess Iris is curious about who she is and asks. The woman responds quickly by saying that her name is Alpha. Then, she carries out a powerful attack that will cause the monster to transform into a human-like creature. Surprisingly, even as she gets closer to the monster, she demonstrates compassion for it. While Alpha is getting ready to leave, Princess Iris demands that she come back. However, once Alpha had completed the task she had come to do, she instructs the princess to behave like an appropriate audience member and to enjoy the performance that Alpha had just finished giving. She divulges to the princess that they are Shadow Garden and advises the princess to maintain her distance from them. Exactly at that moment, she disappears, and the princess is left to speculate on the nature of the Shadow Garden. An explosion takes place right as she is trying to figure it out, jolting her back to the here and now and forcing her to confront the truth. This leads her to think about her sister who is not present once more, which in turn causes her to wonder where her sister is. While this is going on, Sid and Zenon are still fighting in front of Princess Alexia despite the fact that they are surrounded by the wreckage from the earlier conflict. During the battle, Zenon begins to understand why the other members of the cult had underestimated Sid, which led to Sid's victory over them. Zenon casts a spell that he calls the might of a future knight of rounds in an effort to demonstrate just how powerful he actually is. He refers to this spell as the power of a future knight of rounds. However, his attempts to injure Sid continue to be fruitless because Sid is easily able to shrug off his attacks. This makes it difficult for him to succeed in his goal. After witnessing this, Princess Alexia has a newfound admiration for the formidable power that Sid possesses. Despite the fact that she is not yet aware that he is in fact Sid, the person she has taken as her fake boyfriend. Sid, on the other hand, makes fun of Zenon by pointing out that his apparently tremendous ability as a future knight of rounds is not nearly as advanced as he is as fighter. This causes him to become enraged, and he rushes towards Sid who, despite his best efforts, continues to avoid his attacks. After witnessing this, Princess Alexia is astounded by his extraordinary abilities. However, she is surprised to discover that his fencing is not significantly better than average. She makes a comparison between the sword style that was utilized and her own, expanding on how much she had strived to be like her sister but had always been derided by people for not coming up to her sister's standards. Exactly at that instant, she has the sudden realization that Sid is the only other person who has ever possessed a fencing style that is comparable to to hers. Sid is currently continuing his battle against Zenon, who had previously reached his breaking point in the conflict. Zenon is curious about finding out the truth about Sid's identity, and he issues a challenge to him to come clean about it because he notices that Sid possesses a great deal of power. At this point, Sid reaffirms to him that they are the Shadow Garden, a group whose primary objective is to track down and apprehend people who live and roam within the shadows. Zenon decides to take some drugs that will give him an increased capacity for strength as a last-ditch effort. He goes through a change as a direct result of taking the pills, which causes him to become a more ferocious warrior, who refers to himself as the Third Awakened. He is of the opinion that the only people who should be permitted to participate in the rounds are those who are able to exercise control over the power that he possesses and not let it slip from their grasp. After that, he reveals a force that he calls the power of the Almighty, and causes it to be released. After the enormous effort that Zenon put forth, Sid is offended that Zenon would think of himself as a god because of all he has accomplished. He views this as an insult to the Almighty and an act of blasphemy against him. In a fit of rage, he charges at Zenon and immediately begins to deliver vicious blows to him. Sid is adamant that there is no way to achieve all powerfulness through the utilization of a power that was not one's own to begin with. Before he unleashes his final move, he tells Zenon the story about how he had tried to protect himself from being hit by a nuclear weapon. But instead he ended up turning himself into a nuclear weapon. Zenon is shocked to hear this. After that, Zenon watches as his Sid performs his finishing move. He calls this power his almighty power, and it is the power that transforms him into an atomic being. It also enables him to vaporize Zenon, which is what he means when he says it. Princess Iris is present when the explosion occurs, and she observes the site where it took place after it has already occurred. 
In the hopes of finding her sister, she doesn't waste any time and dashes off in that direction immediately. Princess Alexia, on the other hand, showed no signs of being shaken or affected in any way by the explosion. As soon as Princess Iris finally gets a look at her sister, she is overcome with excitement and rushes to embrace her in joy. The following day, Princess Alexia resumes her regular routine by going back to school as she does every day. She is with Sid, who has assumed his former identity as a student. She goes on to describe her struggles to Sid who doesn't seem particularly interested in hearing about them. At that precise moment, she shows her appreciation to him for the compliment he had previously paid to her fencing technique by expressing her gratitude. She assuages his fears by assuring him that she has reconciled her feelings regarding her fencing technique and that she now appreciates it. Then, Princess Alexia begs Sid to continue pretending to be in a relationship with her for a short while longer before he leaves. Sid declines her offer and this causes her to smile weirdly. The members of the Shadow Garden who report to Lord Shadow, the leader of the organization, compliment him on the many achievements he has achieved. They are operating under the assumption that one day, all of their opponents will be vanquished. They are concerned about a number of things, one of which is the recent impersonation of their organization by individuals who are unknown to them. Despite this, they are certain that those responsible for these scams will be held accountable in the end. Meanwhile, Princess Iris has recently gained knowledge about the Cult of Diablos and the Shadow Garden and as a result, she has reason to believe that something sinister is taking place. She is under the impression that there is some sort of link between them. As a consequence of this, she comes to the conclusion that a new research team should be established, and that Glenn and Marco should take the helm. On the other hand, back in the school, there is a girl who is wandering around with a stack of books in her hands, and Sid unintentionally blocks her path, which results in the unfortunate event of her dropping the books that she was carrying. Despite this, he extends his hand to her in an attempt to help her stand but she does not respond and appears to be rendered speechless by his presence. A man is being chased and finally caught and he is seen begging for his life. He begs not to be killed, but his plea falls on deaf ears as he is killed immediately with a sword by the Shadow Hunter. After the man is killed, he begins to move, announcing himself as the Shadow Hunter just before disappearing. Sid is making a bowl of soup with his two friends in a restaurant. They ask what has happened between him and Princess Alexia. He responds and says they broke up and there is nothing else to discuss. His friends angrily ask if they were close with each other at all and he responds negatively. His friends are so disappointed that they term Sid and Princess Alexia's relationship a waste and call him hopeless. One of his friends tells him about a place that can be of help to them but the others respond angrily because he thinks it's another place. They both exchange some words and the first friend tells the other that the place he is talking about is called Mitsugoshi, the one everyone is talking about where a lot of things are being sold that have never been seen before and that they sell something called chocolate that is tasty, and that they are using it to get different girls. While this argument was going on, Sid is seen minding his business and drinking his bowl of soup, but when he hears the part that something called chocolate was used to get girls, he pauses and looks up. When his friends noticed that he looked up, they told him that they must go in unison. He had no choice but to agree because they were so excited about going and he was curious about the chocolate they talked about. Meanwhile, Sherry Barnett is with her father, Iris and Alexia, in a study. An object is shown to her which she thinks is an artifact, but it is explained to her that it was confiscated from a facility that belonged to an organization that calls themselves the Cult of Diablos, which they know nothing about. It was brought to her because they wanted her to do research on it because she is the most brilliant mind in the kingdom and no researcher in the field is better than her. She is shocked, but she is still a student. They also tell her that rumors have spread to neighboring towns of how good she is and that she was talked about at the Academy for Dark Nights. Her father assures her that it is a good opportunity that she should take it, and that one day she will travel the world with her research and that she should have faith in herself. She thinks about what her father said and she agrees to do it. The lady tells her that the Crimson Order will be assigned to her to watch over her. Her surprised father asked if that was a new order of knights that had been recently established that he didn't know about. She explained to him that they are small orders that a knight can trust. After Sherry agrees, Alexia volunteers to help her because she wants to find out who they are and what they want. Iris agrees and tells Alexia to promise her that she would stay out of danger. Alexia thanks her. Sid and his friends are seen in Mitsugoshi and they are told that the current wait was 80 minutes. The boys start thinking if they should wait or go because they don't want to miss curfew. However, one of them is also scared of the rumors they heard about the killers that go around after dark. But the other one tells him he is stupid that they have three dark knights on their team, so there is nothing that happened. Sid was curious about the killer that was mentioned but no attention was given to him by his friends as they continued walking without giving him an answer. As they were walking, a young lady walked up to the three of them and asked Sid if he would be interested in taking a survey. His friends responded saying they would love to take the survey too. 
However, the lady says it is only one person she needs and she leaves with Sid. They walked into a mall and he was looking at everything his eyes could see. He realizes that he was just following her, that he doesn't know where he is going and he reminds the lady about the survey. But he is taken through a door and that was just a way to meet up to meet his friend Gamma, whom he saved her life and also because he trained her. Gamma happens to be on the throne and she says she is excited about meeting him. So she hurriedly goes down the stairs to greet him but trips and falls down on her face and it starts to bleed. Sid, on the other hand, says to himself that she was one of the smartest people he knows. When she trips, he says that she has no athletic ability. She tells him to sit while the blood was being cleaned off her face. As he sits on the chair, he says he feels like a king, like he has truly become the eminence in shadow. He also wonders how Gamma was able to build and manage the expensive place. He rewards her but she says she can't accept it because she doesn't deserve his honor, and the fact that he saved her life was enough that she can't forget that ever in her life. Sid moves on to asking if her shop was making a good profit for her, and she explains that she has different investors for the business, and that she has approximately one billion zenny for immediate disposal. Sid exclaims in shock, but Gamma thinks it isn't enough, he replies negatively. His mind wandered about thinking of how she used his knowledge to build all that without him supervising, and also how he built where he was and that he should be happy. But what mattered to him the most was that she made more money. After Sid settles down, she tells him that an incident is about to happen. That happens to be the killer who appeared at the royal capital. The ones that pretend to be the shadow garden that they are currently investigating the situation but they haven't apprehended the perpetrators. She assures him that they will put an end to their misdeeds. Sid then remembers his friends talking about the killer. He tells her that he has an idea of the person behind it and that he will look into it and she starts to sing praises of him that she expected it because of his kingdom. As he begins to walk away, Gamma introduces new to him that she is the newest number and she tells him that he could use her however he pleases. He says he will call if he needs anything. As he was about going, he told her that he wanted chocolate. While he was talking to her, he was also stealing Zenny from her. She informs him that the chocolates will be given to him for free and he seems excited. Sid and his friends are seen running with chocolates in their hands as they are almost late for curfew and they are shooting at Sid for coming late because he was flirting with the survey lady. He apologized and reminded them he had got the chocolates for them. As he is running, he thinks Alexia is the killer and wonders why. He concludes that she probably lost it and that she didn't make sense before. While running, he senses a sword being used, then he stops abruptly while his friends also turn to find out why he stopped. He had to lie that he wanted to poop and she shouldn't wait for him. She stays behind to find the people impersonating the Shadow Hunter. Alexia fights the Shadow Hunter and keeps fighting them and she notices that they have become three. She begins to fight them alone until Sid appears and then she realizes that they are imposters and two of them are killed while the other one escapes. As Sid tries to leave, he is stopped by Alexia to ask what he wants, what he uses all the power for and what he is fighting against. Sid turns and tells her to stay out of it. He disappears. Sid goes about looking for the one that escapes and he finally finds him. He confronts him that did he think he could run away from him. Gamma appears, tells him well done that she didn't think he could capture them so quickly and pleads to take them from there so that she gets the information from him. Sid tells her not to mess it up and she says she won't. She threatens the imposter that she is not as forgiving as Lord Shadow. Alexia explains what happened to Iris and Iris asks her if she is alright. Alexia begins and says the killer is not from Shadow Garden. Then Iris says that maybe the killer is from a different organization that falsely assumed the name. Alexia replies and says that is not what Shadow told her, that she met with someone from Shadow Garden when she was defending the royal captain from those simultaneous attacks, and that her name was Alpha. Shadow is fighting against the cult of Diablos. Iris tells Alexia that they might find something when the artifact is deciphered. Alexis asks Iris who she thinks is the enemy, Shadow Garden or the cult of Diablos and she answers both. Iris responds that she won't allow anyone to wreak havoc in her kingdom. Sid is with his friends on a train and his friends mock him about what happened the previous day about the pooping in his pants and that it was bad luck. Sid replies that he thinks the trails for the very day would be much worse. His friend asks if he had brought the chocolate along and he answers in affirmation. His friends were so excited that they declared the day operation gift giver, that they can't wait to give their chocolates to their ladies. His two friends take their chocolates and decide to give them to their ladies and it both ends in total failure. Sid sits down in the library and takes his own chocolate and says he will give it to any girl he sees first. He begins to walk and then he sees a lady who turns out to be Sherry studying about the artifact given to her to research on and just drops the chocolate on the book that was on her table and says she could have it. Then he walks away. Sherry looked at the chocolate in a very confused way. Sherry is in her study staring at the chocolate, wondering what to do with it. Her father walks in coughing and sees the chocolate and he explains to her that it was meant as a gift to her after she told him a boy gave it to her. He also tells her it was called love at first sight. Her father then asks her what she would tell him as an answer and she looks confused again. 
Her father breaks it down, that as much as the research is important, she also needs to learn how to interact with others, because that is what school is for. He asks how the deciphering is going, she says it has started. Then he begins to cough more loudly and frequently. Sherry says she will call the doctor right away but he stops her and tells her he is feeling much better. She is just feeling lucky to have a daughter like her. She says she is the lucky one, and further inquires if he hadn't adopted her when he did. He then tells her that her mother was a good researcher, so that she can do it. Sid's attention is drawn to a poster that announces a tournament in fencing. While he is looking at it, he is followed by Nu, a member of the Shadow Garden who just so happens to be dressing in his school uniform at the time. When he first sees her, he guesses that she is a student at the school. However, she reveals that she is just trying to fit in by wearing the school uniform so it won't draw too much attention to herself. She fills him in on the details of the black-clad suspect they had apprehended earlier. It would appear that he had been subjected to brainwashing. Unfortunately, this is also the case with some other individuals who are recognized as being the vanguard of the cult of Diablos, and they are referred to as the third children. Mew had a difficult time coaxing any information out of the man as a result of the effectiveness of the brainwashing. At this point, Sid shows no sign of being interested in what she has to say, and she is utterly ignored by him. On the other hand, he is concerned about the tournament that his friends have shown him and that they have discussed with him before. They try to persuade him to participate in the competition, but he doesn't appear to have much interest in it. As a last-ditch effort, they try to sway him by explaining that they would have participated if it weren't for their injuries. Sid, on the other hand, keeps insisting that he is not even somewhat interested in the contest they are talking about. Surprisingly, they consider using the strategy of making girls like him as a way to convince Sid, but he doesn't buy it and instead replies by punching them in the stomach. Sid removes the poster from their hands and examines it intently as they struggle to deal with the pain caused by the punches that he had just delivered. <laughs> Then, he recalls New talking about how the cult of Diablos had begun that tournament as a means of recruiting orphans in an effort to make them children of Diablos after administering drugs to brainwash them. It would appear that this was the mode of operation that the cult had used for many years. In addition, Nu has a sneaking suspicion that the cult is simply using their moniker, Shadow Garden, in an attempt to coax them out of hiding. Despite hearing all this, Sid is unwavering in his commitment to compete in the event. Exactly at that moment, he is briefed on the arrival in the capital of a first child by the name of Rex. It would appear that a first child is one who has developed a feeling of who they are in spite of the fact that they are one of the children. Nu is concerned that they are sending named children to the capital, and she is also troubled by the possibility that they may have another objective in mind by doing so. While Sid mulls over what she has said, he comes to the conclusion that the matter requires further consideration. Nu is however filled with admiration for her master as she watches him leave, and she has faith that he will figure out a way to resolve this problem that is the most effective. She refers to his unique ability to find solutions to problems as the wisdom of the shadows. A few days later, the competition starts, and the students all start yelling with excitement as they watch the two competitors square off against each other. Even though Princess Alexia is still injured, the students continue to speak about how well she would do in the tournament despite the fact that she is not now participating. Despite this, they continue to have faith that Rose, the president of the student council, will prove to be a formidable opponent throughout the competition. During this time, the students are placing their bets on who they believe will emerge victorious from the competition, and they appear to be having a good time doing it. On the other hand, this is not the case for Sid's friends, who seem to have used up all of the money they possessed by betting on combatants who went on to lose their bouts. In the midst of their mourning, it was revealed that the next fight would be between Rose, the president of the student council, and a boy of unknown identity. Her adversary turns out to be none other than Sid, which comes as quite a surprise. While he is standing in front of her, he spends his time scrutinizing her and ultimately concludes that she is the most skilled swordswoman in the academy. As soon as the match starts, it seems as though Sid is ready to demonstrate the advanced techniques he has acquired. On the other hand, it turns out that these tactics are not for fighting at all, rather, they are techniques that he uses to further depict himself as a background student. Sig quickly puts a blood tablet in his mouth and enables himself to be hit by Rose as the two charge at each other with the intention of defeating the other. Sid then loses his balance and falls to the ground, blood pouring out of his mouth. As the students watch, they are ecstatic, and the official is about to pronounce Rose the victor when Sid gives the indication that the fight is not yet done. At this moment, he gets to his feet and makes another assault on Rose, going through the same humiliating motions over and over again, more resolute in his efforts to display the background character techniques he possesses. After a number of rounds of being defeated, Rose is perplexed as to why he continues to fight on. She, on the other hand, respects the level of determination he possesses and insists that she is in the wrong for having underestimated him. Towards that precise moment, she makes the decision to charge at him while using the maximum amount of her might. To our relief, and out of genuine concern for Sid's life-threatening injuries, the referee steps in and pushes Sid out of the way, therefore preventing Sid from having to face her attack. 
After that, he announces that Rose is the victor. When Sid hears this, he becomes enraged because he still has a great deal of background techniques to demonstrate. On the other side, Rose is not surprised by the verdict made by the referee, and is astonished by how much pain Sid had been through during the bout. After that, she acknowledges that Sid was victorious in the battle between their spirits, and she expresses her respect for him. Sid emerges from the battle with bandages wrapped around his head, despite the fact that he sustained no injuries whatsoever. As he makes his way around the school, he is approached by a young lady who appears to be quite worried about how he is doing. She inquires as to how he is doing before she and him go to a nearby cafe to get some coffee. In a short amount of time following that, she gives him some freshly baked cookies and begs him to be her friend. Sid doesn't understand why she offered him cookies or why she wants to make friends with him, but he goes forward with the plan anyway. She instantly informed her father, who had been seated at a table behind her the entire time, when she heard him agree to it which caused her to feel a great deal of excitement. Sid recognizes her father to be Lutheran Barnet, a master swordsman who is on the list of people he should never interact with in order to keep his secret a secret. The two remain concerned about Sid's injury and insist that he have himself checked out by a medical professional, which he agrees to do on his way back to his house. This is done in order to prevent them from following him and discovering that he is not hurt at all. Sherry's father requests Sid to be good to his daughter because she had no friends, which is a shocking request to him as he wonders why he has to be in such a situation. He however resorts to using his injury as a means to avoid her for a few days. When Sherry returns to her house, she continues to worry about Sid and mulls over the possibility of paying him a visit. However, she is reminded that Princess Alexia and Sid might be dating when her thoughts are interrupted by Princess Alexia and Sid's possibility of being with each other. To make this point abundantly clear, she makes the decision to pay Princess Alexia a personal visit in order to question her. When she arrives at Princess Alexia's house, she is informed that the two are not dating and have never actually dated in the first place because their relationship was a sham all along. When she hears this, she gets enthusiastic and tells the princess that she has just recently become friends with Sid herself and that she wanted to make sure that he and the princess were not dating. She then explains to the princess how ecstatic she is at the news, and then she exits the princess's presence. The princess, on the other hand, does not appear to be happy and makes every effort to cover up her feelings of jealousy. Tripping, bro. You tripping. <laughs> Meanwhile, the students are looking forward to receiving an explanation regarding the procedure for voting for student council the following day. After Rose and another member of the student council eventually show up, the two of them start explaining what happened. At the same moment, members of the Cult of Diablos unleash a massive shield around the school, which causes all of the students to lose their ability to use magic. When this first takes place, it appears like Sid is the only one who recognizes it at that time. While all of this is going on, Princess Alexia is making her way to the academy. It is likely that Sherry's display of affection for Sid has upset her. On the other hand, to her amazement, the school gates were already closed when she arrived, and she finds this to be very surprising. During this time, Sid begins to experience the effects of the huge shield when he finds that he is unable to use any magic. However, he is perplexed as to why no one else has made this observation. While he is paying attention, he hears the footsteps of some men approaching the group of students who are gathered together. In a short amount of time after that, they stormed into the room, introduced themselves as Shadow Garden, and declared that they were going to take control of the school. Rose, in her role as president of the student council, brandishes her sword and ridicules them for their attempt to take control of the Academy of Dark Knights. She stubbornly refuses to comply with their demand that she put down her weapon, which results in one of them charging at her. She is blissfully ignorant of the fact that her magic is ineffective, and as a result, she attempts to use it against them. Her sword is shattered into pieces, and she is left completely bewildered after the shocking development. In a fit of rage, one of the men charges at her once more, this time preparing to pierce her with a sword. However, Sid comes in between them and is cut instead, leaving nothing but complete shock and the speculation that he has died. Everyone, including Rose, froze up and was left in a complete state of shock after Sid took the deep slash of sword to the heart. Still in shock, Rose utters Sid's name completely with a trembling body and voice. Her eyes didn't move an inch away from his body as it lies down in the pool of blood. She gets on her knees above Sid's body and holds his head in her hands. She yells her painful thought of concern for him in anger by calling him an idiot and asking him why he had to get in the way. She is concerned that he is injured as a result of his actions, because he has lost a significant amount of blood and is very close to dying. He is unable to communicate with her in any way other than to tell her that he has died. Immediately he stops breathing. For a while, Rose analyzes his previous acts or the situation that has involved Sid and her. She is able to discern and understand them more clearly than she ever has before. She is aware that her dear Sid cares and loves her a great deal, to the point that he is willing to lay down his life for her. Still in tears as the wielder of the sword that killed Sid points it at her and tells her they are going to the auditorium. 
He threatens she would end up dead like Sid if she proves adamant and put up a fight against them. She gives one final expression of gratitude to Sid with tears streaming down her cheeks and reaching his face. After that, each individual is escorted to an auditorium within the academy. Later on that same day, Sid, whom they thought had died, has not completely passed away yet. It is all a part of his grand scheme. He brings his right hand up, makes a fist with it, and then uses his magical abilities to strike his chest multiple times with the intention of reviving himself. He continues to do this until his heart actually begins beating again. Finally, he comes back to life. After standing for a few seconds and being relieved that the background character secret technique 10 minute death, heartbreak worked. He takes several deep breaths. He has been well aware the entire time that he is not going to perish. His objective all along has been to only practice the method. He was able to keep a consistent blood flow to his brain by using magic to control the flow of his blood, which allowed him to do so even when his heartbeat had stopped. He continues by explaining that if even one step had been performed incorrectly, he would already be in the hereafter. He is aware that it is a very risky move. He notes that the magic obstruction shield at the academy is still impeding the flow of his magic. Nevertheless, he comes to the realization that his magic will be unaffected so long as he continues to spin it into threads. Therefore, he employs it in the process of stitching together his pierced skin and the fabric. His attention is pulled to the magic barrier. He immediately realizes that they have put up the entire magic blocking scenario. He feels it would be extremely impolite of him to completely ignore the fact that they have done so. He left the afterwards. Sherry is likely busy at work on an item at the academy at this very moment. She unearths something that is quite interesting. Unexpectedly, a man can be seen barging in via the window. Sherry is told that he is Rex, the great game of betrayal when he first approaches her. She conceals the artifact as swiftly as possible. The pendant artifact needs to be recovered, and that's Rex's goal. When the job is finished, his superior promises, he will have free reign to cause as much chaos as he pleases. Instantaneously, he draws his sword from its sheath and strikes her with it. Unexpectedly, two men rush to her aid and save her. While one of them defends themselves from Rex's attack inside, the other one battles outside. Rex is told by the man who is inside that his name is Glenn, and that he is the vice commander of the Crimson Order. Sherry is given an opportunity to escape thanks to Marco, the second man. Sid is seen standing on the roof outside. Everything, both on the outside and on the other side of the magical barrier is visible to him. He notices that the hostages are being rounded up and brought inside the auditorium. He observes that there is no longer any security in place. He witnessed the terrorists searching for students who had hidden themselves. He is quite proud of his status as the eminence of shadow. He became irritated all of a sudden by the fact that they were dressed in all black during the middle of the day. He stresses the need of dressing in all black when going out at night. After that, he uses his abilities to stealthily eliminate every single terrorist he comes across. He sees Sherry acting like a complete moron begging to be taken captive as she wanders around. Additionally, he eliminates each and every soldier that makes an attempt to see Sherry. Sherry had no idea what was going on here. He jumps off the roof in order to start putting his plan into action. Sherry is currently on her way to the bedroom of her father. She is looking for records that may contain additional information on the relic. She falls while climbing the stairs to the second floor. Almost instantly, Sid reaches out and grabs her to keep her from falling. The sight of blood on him causes her to jump to her feet in disbelief. However, he reassures her that there is no need to be concerned. He offers her guidance on the aspects of her personality that concern him. They are successful in entering Sherry's father's room together. Sid takes a seat in a chair while Sherry searches for other documents containing information on the artifact. She is fortunate enough to uncover a book that provides information on the artifact. While they were reading, they found out that the artifact that was preventing them from using their magic and absorbing it was named the Eye of Avarice. She continues to read out more details, which Sid finds interesting as she does so. They are aware of the purpose behind assembling all of the students in the auditorium at this time. The Cult of Diablos intends to effectively soak up as much of their magic as possible. This book gives more information about the impending disaster that will be brought on by the Eye of Avarice. Sherry has now realized what the artifact she is holding in her palm is. It's the command center for the Eye of Avarice. It is the only thing that can stop any disaster that is about to occur. After she deciphers the artifact, she intends to make her way to the auditorium through hidden tunnels in the academy. Sid thinks that her plan is sound overall but lacking in its execution. Sadly, she forgot to bring any of the tools required to fine-tune the artifact from her study room. Therefore, Sid agrees and promises to get it for her. In the auditorium, Rex's superior is currently venting his frustration at his inability to complete the task at hand. He attempts to reason his way out of the situation. However, his superior becomes even more irate about it. He warns him that he will be killed if he utters a single word. He implores and convinces his superior that he does not deserve to be killed. He granted him forgiveness and gave him a second opportunity. As he is leaving, he mentions to his superior the existence of a genuine master fighter who is concealed at the school in some location. 
His supervisor has already guessed as to who it could be and awaits him. Rex goes in search of the girl who has the item. He is accompanied by four other combatants in this adventure. Suddenly, he becomes confused as the four combatants that were around him suddenly vanish without leaving any trace. As a result of his confusion, he lets his defenses down which allows Sid to hit him. Rex employs magic spells to trap Sid. Surprisingly, nothing can stand up to Sid's magical abilities, and everything is a waste of time. After sustaining a number of blows, he comes to a startling realization. He sees a large number of members of the Cult of Diablos who have been murdered in a very gruesome manner. Sid takes Rex's life with one final critical hit while he is attempting to make sense of what he is seeing. In Sherry's chamber, Nu is conducting an autopsy on the bodies of Glenn and Marco. Marco is ready to be the target of her next spell. After that, Sid walks in from the back. He managed to catch her off guard. He has arrived to search for the tools required to fine-tune the artifact. Sid observes that she is attempting to complete a task before he enters the room, but Nu denies it. She divulges the fact that Marco was her betrothed. She is aware of the reason for her visit, and as a result, she gets right to the point. She has come to deliver reports regarding the genuine Shadow Garden's infiltration of the Academy. They are waiting for Sid's command. She warns of the severe dangers that come with initiating an attack while under the influence of the Eye of Avarice, which limits the use of magic. In addition, she claims that only the Seven Shadows are capable of fighting at the standard level. She mentioned the fact that out of the Seven Shadows, only Lady Gamma is enrolled in the Academy at the present time. Sadly, she lacks any combat sense. In addition, she notes that there has been no activity on the part of the Cult of Diablos. She stated that in order to create their own defenses, the Cult take advantage of sealing off the magical powers of its opponents. In addition, the knights located outside of the Academy are mentioned in the reports. Princess Iris and the commanding commanders of the reinforcements are the only ones who are primarily valuable in battle. The last part of her report is the conclusion. When Nu was giving her report, Sid was occupied with looking for some items. Suddenly, in response to her, he asks her where he can locate certain items in the room. It would appear that he has no idea what the items look like at all. Despite this, she responds to his questions without having any idea why he needs them in the first place. She inquires about it out of curiosity, and he fills her in. She was taken aback by Sid's ability to adjust the parameters of an artifact. He goes into great detail with her regarding the findings that he and Sherry made concerning the artifact. According to Nu, it is the most challenging and represents the highest level of knowledge in the kingdom. The apparent simplicity with which Sid describes the process continues to astound and startle her. Sid rushes away from her presence in order to get to Sherry quickly with the intention of handing off those tools and other items to her. He is hopeful that he and Sherry will be able to accomplish the work swiftly and before the sun sets. Sid is eagerly anticipating Nu's plan to launch an assault at the moment Sid and Sherry will have completed their work. She takes another look at the lifeless body of Marco, but she has no idea what to do with him. But she is holding off on punishing him till another time. In a few moments, everyone is patiently waiting at alert, having prepared themselves, being ready to battle, and having the spirit to do so. While she is working with her equipment, Sherry says a prayer asking for her father's assistance. With the students still captured in the academy, Princess Iris and the knights are worried about the next line of action to take. They are unable to do anything due to the magical barrier around the school. Their efforts are further frustrated when they realize that their specialists are also trapped in the academy. Meanwhile, inside the academy, the students remain tied and placed together. Their current condition causes President Rose to be angry as she wonders why they have to be tied when they can't possibly do anything with their magic gone. On the other hand, Sid and Sherry try to come up with a solution to the magical barrier around the school. Apparently, the barrier is being put up with the use of the Eye of Avarice. After a while, Sherry is successful in her attempt to come up with a device that can control the Eye of Avarice. Although Sid finds this impressive, he is bothered about the hidden tunnels. Just then, Sherry opens up a hidden passageway behind a bookshelf, and gets ready to head down the dark stairs in hopes of helping her father. Staring at the dark stairway, Sherry is led to remember the night of her mother's death. On that night, her mother was stabbed multiple times. With no one else to take care of her, the man she calls her father showed up and offers to take her in since her mother was his dear friend. The love and affection shown by him prompts her to search for him amidst all the evil things happening in the school. Ready to go down the stairs, Sid wishes her good luck and she thanks him just before heading down. Back where the students are being held, President Rose dissuades one of them from doing anything as he remains restless and wishes to go up against the evil men. She is more adamant about going up against them after evaluating their leader and realizing just how powerful he is. This, however, doesn't stop them, as they are eager to go up against the evil men. Just as they contemplate charging at the men, they hear a loud noise from above. At that moment, they witness some of the men shooting at students. This further strengthens their resolve to revolt, but President Rose continues to demand that they remain calm. They, however, are of the belief that they will all be killed if they do nothing. At that moment, Sherry arrives in a hall above the students and is able to see everything that is going on. 
While looking, she sees the leader of the men bring out the Eye of Avarice. This presents her with the chance she needed to end this hostage situation. Without wasting much time, she throws her magical device at it and a bright light clouds the area, disabling the power of the Eye of Avarice. With the magical barrier disabled, President Rose wastes no time in attacking one of the evil men. Then, she informs the students that their magic has been unsealed, urging them to fight back. Hearing this, the students charge at their captors without mercy, and this scares the hell out of them. However, their leader orders them to kill the students, just before turning to leave. While fighting, President Rose sets her sight on the leader and is determined to get him no matter what. Unfortunately, her efforts are futile when the men crowd her, giving her no chance at their leader. In the heat of battle, President Rise senses a powerful presence. Just then, Sid appears in his true form as Shadow. Fortunately for the students, he arrives with an army. At that moment, he introduces them as Shadow Garden. Leaving the students out, they attack the imposters, cutting them down so easily. With the evil men now occupied with fighting off the real Shadow Garden, President Rose orders the students to leave the auditorium immediately. Of course, the students waste no time as they all flee to safety, leaving the fight to the obviously superior fighters. Meanwhile, Sherry continues to look for her father, who is nowhere to be found. On the other hand, the leader of the evil men releases a chemical that causes the building to light up in flames. With the barrier down, Princess and the knights charge into the compound, only to see the students already safe and outside the burning building. When she inquires about what happened, she is told by President Rose that they were saved by a mysterious organization who call themselves Shadow Garden. Hearing this name called one more time causes Princess Iris to be worried. Meanwhile, with all the students safe, Sherry still remains in the burning building as she continues to look for her father. However, the leader of the evil men goes to an office in the building in a bid to take off his disguise. Before doing so, he burns some books. Just then, Sid arrives, asking him why he is in such a costume. As surprising as the question sounded, he reveals that the leader is actually Professor Lutheran Burnett, Sherry's father. With his cover blown, the professor removes his mask, demanding to know how Sid found out. In response, Sid teases him about finding out due to the way he walked. Just then, Sid demands to know why he is doing all this, since he didn't seem like someone who would portray characteristics of being evil. To this, the professor reveals that he is doing this because he didn't get a chance to attain the top and most glorified level of swordsmanship he had hoped to get, despite how exceptional he was. This dream of his was hindered by a sickness he had just as he was so close to achieving this. Furthermore, he tells Sid about his involvement in Sherry's mother's research that prompted her to get hold of the Eye of Avarice. However, at the time, she believed it was dangerous and suggested that they hand it over to the government for safekeeping. This caused the professor to be angry and kill her gruesomely. At the time when Sherry found her dead mother, she never knew what happened and continued her mother's research, not realizing that the man she had taken as her father was actually the one who killed her mother. Hearing this, Sid claims that everyone has something which they claim in their journey through life. After the two share their weird and brief ideology of life, they decide to stop talking and get to fighting. Sid pulls out his sword to face off the professor, and just as expected, he pulls off the most useless form of swordsmanship ever. This gives the professor a sense of relaxation, since he had just defeated the only one who seems to know his true identity. After killing Sid, he turns to leave. Shortly after turning to leave, he hears a voice from behind asking where he is going. At that moment, he turns around to see Sid in his true form as Shadow. As much as Shadow's presence scares him, he tries to act like he isn't. Facing Shadow, he acknowledges that he is at a disadvantage. Just then, he brings out the Eye of Avarice and merges with his body in such a way that it prompts his rebirth and makes him more powerful. Surprisingly, his supposedly powerful magic is still no match for Shadow's power. He blocks the professor's attacks without much of an effort, just before cutting the professor's shoulder. Angrily, the professor charges him in retaliation. While they fight, the professor informs him about the plans he has made to blame Shadow for all that has happened. Surprisingly, the professor reveals that he has placed evidence, witness statements and everything that would make it believable for Shadow to be branded as a traitor, causing the entire world to hunt him down. When Shadow hears all this, he doesn't seem to care about all the professor has said. Instead, he tells the professor that he would gladly accept all of the hatred, further stating that it won't change anything since Shadow Garden has always operated not caring about anyone's perspective but theirs alone. He proves just how unbothered he is about the professor's threats, and this gets the latter worried. Since his earlier plan to blame Shadow seems to be useless, he charges at him angrily, hoping to cause great harm. But Shadow, once again, swerves his attempts. Then, Shadow stabs him multiple times, reminding him of what he did to Sherry's mother, just before stabbing his heart and destroying the Eye of Avarice. The death of the professor gives Shadow the relaxing justification he expects Sherry to feel. At this moment, Sherry finally finds her father, but in the same state she saw her mother years ago. While she screams for him to wake up, Shadow is tempted to reveal his deed of killing her mother but decides to let it go since it would be harder for her if she found out. Later on, Shadow Garden sees a release blaming Shadow for all that has happened. 
This leaves them untethered and determined to go through with Shadow's resolve. The next day, Sherry meets with Sid. She thanks him for helping her the day before, revealing that she would never have done it without his help. Just then, she informs him of her decision to study abroad in Logos, a city known for science. Before she leaves, she tells Sid that there is something she needs to do and has decided to go abroad in search of knowledge to accomplish it. Furthermore, she says she had hoped to get a chance to know Sid better. While she picks up her bag to leave, Sid seeks to know what the thing she needs to do is. In reply, she states that it is a secret. Due to the destruction of the school, courtesy of the vicious battle between the fake Shadow Gardens and the real Shadow Gardens, the students are forced to go back home. This ended up being an early summer break for them. However, with all the students gone, Sid remains in his hostel since he has nothing to do at home although he gradually begins to realize that there is nothing to do in school either. While going about his boring day, he receives a letter from Alpha, telling him to come to the sacred land, Lindworm. Meanwhile, one of Lord Shadow's girls, Beta, looks at herself in the mirror. At first, she looks dejected but suddenly transforms her body into a supposedly perfect one. Just then, she reveals how Lord Shadow had given her the power to change her fate when she first met him. Not so shockingly, she had decided at that moment to use the power to change her current form, which she finds not so admirable. From that moment, she had apparently grown obsessed with him. This had prompted her to write and come up with stories about how he considered her to be his charming young elf. Even though her stories do not flow as easily as she expects them to, this is largely because she thinks they are too dramatic. Furthermore, she blames herself for using a shady character as the female lead. Frustrated by how badly her writing is going, she decides to go outside in order to get some fresh air. Outside the building, she is met by Epsilon and the two engage in a fierce competition about who has got the bigger chest. Just then, Epsilon informs Beta about Lord Shadow's sudden show of interest and intense gaze towards her. She states that she has recently felt the intense passion of his gaze in her heart. Hearing this, Beta is offended and assumes it to be a mistake, but Epsilon insists that it is true and not a mistake. Furthermore, she tries to mock Beta, stating that she would probably have experienced the same gaze at one time since she had a bigger chest. At this point, Beta finds the conversation to be uncomfortable, and would probably be seeking a way to leave. Fortunately for her, one of the girls, named Nu, comes with a new directive from Lady Alpha. On the other hand, Princess Iris and Princess Alexia are at a mall shopping for some clothes for the latter's trip to the Sacred Land. Apparently, Princess Alexia is being sent there as a special guest for the goddess's trial. Since Princess Iris had accompanied her for this shopping, she asked her sister to stick to the trends in the capital. Princess Alexia, however, assures her sister, stating that she could use the time to investigate issues related to the recent happenings in the kingdom and get useful information that would aid them in tackling pending matters arising in the kingdom. Furthermore, she urges her sister to be calm since her innocent appearance would make her devoid of any suspicion. Hearing this, Princess Iris is optimistic, since she believes people are less guided around Princess Alexia than around her. Although she doesn't want her sister to engage in the investigation, and wishes she hadn't told her about it. While the two talk, they are interrupted by the president of the mall, who apologizes for not coming out earlier to greet them. On her arrival, she offers them some tasty snacks. Seeing how tasty it is, Princess Alexia demands that some of it be taken to her room. Just then, she asks the president if there are any other new items which she could pick from since she would be traveling. Although she eventually asks to see articles of clothing which the president recommends for her. Hearing this, Princess Iris reminds her that they have already gotten party dresses. Princess Alexia, however, is not pleased with this and demands to be shown something more casual which she would wear every day. Listening to her talk, the president figures out what exactly she needs. She immediately calls their attention to see a clothing line she would like. Surprisingly, the princesses are shown some pairs of pretty attractive women's undergarments. <laughs> Boy. Seeing them, the princesses are shocked to their bones. While Princess Iris complains about the lack of fabrics on them and the fact that she can see through them. Princess Alexia declares her confidence in her backside. Hearing this, Princess Iris reminds her that what she is saying isn't the point. Just while she states that, Princess Alexia pulls the undergarments off of the model, ready to try them on. The two continue to argue in the changing room. Noticing that her sister won't give up on her continuous nagging, Princess Alexia clearly asks her sister if the undergarments really deserve such unwavering rejection. In response, Princess Iris is speechless and unable to give a definite answer. This prompts Princess Alexia's victory, leading her to buy the undergarment and more like it. Meanwhile, earlier on, when the school building was on fire, the students ran around trying to save whoever they could find. President Rose, however, remains keen on finding Sid. She does this because she had apparently fallen in love with him after he saved her life. Seeing her, Sid, who lay, covered in bandages, is frustrated. This is because he doesn't want to be disturbed. Unfortunately for him, his act of heroism had just earned him the heart of the president of the student's council. From that day, President Rose continued to stand by Sid's side. On his trip to the sacred land, he decodes to board a train. 
unfortunately, he was met by President Rose, who insisted on accompanying him. While on the trip and angry at President Rose's clinginess, he wishes he had just waited till night since he would be able to get to the sacred land effortlessly. He blames himself for choosing to board a train like a proper background character. While on the trip, Sid finds himself copping with her excesses. She seeks to know if his reason for going to the sacred land is due to the goddess's trial. In response, he admits that is the reason, although he truly doesn't know why he had been summoned by Alpha and assumes the goddess trial to be it. While he ponders on that, Princess Alexia once again thanks him for saving her life. Just then, she stated how certain she was that their path would be a thorny one. Surprisingly, Princess Iris states how no one will approve their union or give them the blessing they would require to become one. Not like Sid cares though. Still, she continues to talk about the possibility of them being together. This time, she urges him to win the goddess trial, stating that his victory would enable her to speak to her father about being with a brave young man like him. While she continues to talk, Sid seems focused on the divine teachings which she had placed in front of him. Looking closely at it, he recognizes one of the holy sites and the divine teachings to be Lindworm, the site where they are headed. Apparently, this was the site where the goddess condescended to alight upon the earth in order to grant power to three heroes. At this moment, President Rose continues to talk about how thorny the road to their being together would be. Furthermore, she demands that they keep their relationship hidden and not speak about it to anyone. At this point, Sid realizes what she has been trying to do all along. Apparently, she was just trying to convert him to her religion. This prompts him to be more keen on wanting some space. That night, she comes to his cabin to check up on him but he is nowhere to be found. Seeing this, she disappointedly heads back to her cabin. If only she had looked up, she would have seen Sid hiding directly above the door in order to shield himself from her constant talk about being together. After two days of evading her and keeping his space, Sid finally arrives at the sacred land. While walking around the city, President Rose sees her favorite author, Natsu, having a book signing event. For the first time on the trip, she leaves him willingly, as she seeks to meet her favorite author. When she leaves, Sid takes a look at the books written by the author, Natsu. Seeing them, he believes that the books have been blatantly plagiarized. The stories cause him to figure out that the writer would probably have been reincarnated. Wanting to know who this writer is, he attends the book signing. Getting to the author, he realizes it is no one but Beta. She had apparently written the stories he had told her of his past life. The stories he told her in order for her to get some inspiration for her writing. However, he feels very disappointed that she went on to blatantly write them as he said. Meanwhile, when she hands him back his signed book, she informs him that the details of the mission have been written there. He, however, doesn't pay much attention to it and is angry that she would do this, stating how disappointed he was in her. After the signing, President Rose catches up with Sid and she continues to talk about her book this time. When Sid opens his book, he sees a weird-looking writing in the space meant for the author's autograph. The two find it hard to decipher what it means, but Cud states that it is cool. On the other hand, Alpha finds herself at a murder scene. Seeing the dead bodies of the top officials in the sacred land, she seeks to know who killed them. While looking at the bodies, the guard came in. Seeing her leave the scene, they assume she is responsible for the murder. This prompts them to order a closure of the cathedral in hopes of catching the murderer. The sound of the bell announcing a murder suspect on the run is heard by Sid, who laughs loudly after hearing it. While watching the city from the rooftop, he sees someone move in the shadow. Shortly after, he catches up with him and doesn't do much but watch Epsilon slice the man with her powers. Seeing her, he asks about the brief on their latest mission. When she breaks it down to him, he decides to go ahead with his plans, demanding that she doesn't fail him while executing hers. Sid arrives safely in Lindworm and decides to have a bath. In his way, he states his preferences, stating how much he likes what he likes and dislikes what he dislikes. Although he is of the opinion that there are insignificant things he likes and dislikes, one of the insignificant things he dislikes being hot springs. Just then, he gets into a hot spring, humming as he enjoys the calm warmth it brings. Surprisingly, he isn't the only one who seems to like hot springs, as Princess Alexia happens to be in the hot spring with him, and is shocked to see him get in. Sid completely ignores her and continues to act like she isn't there. Seriously, what the fuck are you doing? While still enjoying the warmth of the hot spring, still nervous, Princess Alexia summons the courage to begin a conversation. She asks about his injuries, since he seems healed. She is, however, surprised to see this since she had cut him so deeply in their last encounter. In response, Sid refers to her as a killing machine but doesn't say any further when she inquires about what he said. Instead, he seeks to know why she is in town. To this, she states that she had been invited as a guest for the goddess trial. Then, she asks him why he is in town too. In response, he states that a friend had invited him since there was a really fun event going on. Proving to be ignorant, he asks her what exactly people do at the goddess's trial. 
but she finds it surprising that he had come all the way to Lindworm without having an idea about what it is. To let him know, she states that it is a fighting ritual, where ancient warriors are awoken from the sanctuary to compete against challengers. Hearing this, Sid believes that the fighters would be competing against ghosts, recalling that Alpha had mentioned something about such. In the midst of his thoughts, Princess Alexia cuts in, discouraging him from having any hopes of participating in the fight ritual, since it is already too late. Furthermore, she looks down on him by reminding him of the fact that the ancient warriors only answer the call of challengers they deem worthy. While Sid decides to mind his business, Princess Alexia reveals that she will not be participating in the ritual. Furthermore, she makes the shocking revelation about the Archbishop of the Cathedral's death. Although, this didn't seem shocking to Sid at all. His attitude, not seeming to care, didn't stop the princess from divulging the real reason she had come to Lindworm. Apparently, she had been sent to audit the dead archbishop. After saying all this, she decides to stop since she can't say any more to an outsider. Hasn't she said everything already? She, however, tries to convince him to join the Crimson Knights if he wants to know more, but he blatantly refuses. While the two continue to spend some time alone in the hot spring, Princess Alexia reveals her thoughts on Sid, as she assumed he would want to hold her. Sid, however, silently tells her to shun such thoughts, since he had made sure not to look at her throughout his time in the spring with her. This, he says, will keep them more comfortable while bathing. At that moment, he asks her to stop glancing at his body. In her defense, she tries to body shame him but is shocked when he rises up to prove to her never to judge a book by its cover. Then, he leaves her startled and utterly shocked to her bones. The next day, Princess Alexia meets with the acting archbishop as she demands to conduct the audit but he cancels it before she arrives. Demanding to know why he chose to do that, he states that the royal family had sent her to audit the archbishop who now happens to be dead. Furthermore, he states that they need to apprehend the killer and, therefore, have no time for what he terms the princess hobbies. After that, he pleads with her to leave church matters to the church, urging her to just sit back and enjoy the goddess's trial. This gets Princess Alexia very angry and determined to make sure she gets her father's authorization to go ahead with the audit. Still angry at the acting archbishop, Princess Alexia is angrier at Beta in her disguise as the author, Natsum. She feels Natsum's demeanor is too good to be true. She is more disgusted at Natsum's chest size since she gets the feeling that Natsum makes use of this to attract her fans. On the other hand, Natsum recognizes Princess Alexia as the character who tries to get close to her beloved Lord Shadow. She, however, believes that Lord Shadow would never be attracted to the princess. Noticing the suspicious look from Natsum, the princess steps on Natsum's foot. Meanwhile, the acting archbishop begins the goddess trial and the people are excited. One after another, the archbishop calls in and introduces the contenders for the day. Firstly, he introduces a challenger from the Oriana kingdom named Top Aterius. After this, one of the members of the crowd reveals to another the fact that an ancient warrior will be unable to leave once it has been summoned. Not until one of either the ancient warriors or the challenger is defeated. This, one of them claims, has led to the death of a challenger in the past. Hearing this, the other wonders why the challenger tries so much to get into the trial when it could lead to their death. His curiosity is fed with the fact that managing to beat an ancient warrior would get the victor a commemorative medal. With this medal, a challenger is allowed the opportunity of going to any knight order in the world and will be hired instantly. Meanwhile, Sid happens to have paid attention to their conversation. After hearing them talk, he realizes that he will have no chance of doing anything like eminence in the shadow if he decides to fight. However, this doesn't stop him from fantasizing about the possibility of getting into the competition as Lord Shadow and giving people the thrill of a fight while they all wonder who the fighter is. On the other hand, all the challengers have no luck in summoning an ancient warrior, as this means they are all unworthy. At this moment, Sid realizes that he hasn't seen Alpha since he arrived at Lindor. Unknown to him, Alpha seems to be on a delicate mission of her own. In the meantime, and towards the end of the challenge, Sid gets called in as the last challenger. At first, he is unaware that he is the one being referred to. However, when he realizes this, he is shocked, although not as shocked as Natsum and Princess Alexia. While his announcement as a challenger sounds thrilling to the people, since they assume he would be the best student of his academy, Sid sits speechless, wondering why and how B has been selected. Before making a decision, Sid considers three options. Firstly, he chooses not to fight since he would be forced to reveal his identity as Eminence in the Shadow. Secondly, he considers running away, but finds this to be out of it since he wouldn't want to incur the wrath of the Divine Teachings and be expelled from the Academy. Thirdly, well, he decides to go with the third option, which is to cause a confusion. To do this, he plainly shows up as Lord Shadow, announcing his presence. While the Archbishop is startled by Lord Shadow's appearance, the latter goes ahead to summon an ancient warrior. Surprisingly, he ends up summoning the fierce Aurora, Witch of Calamity, who once reigned chaos and destruction on the world. Seeing Aurora, Natsum immediately recognizes her. However, Princess Alexia seemed lost, since she had never heard of her. On the other hand, the Archbishop finds Lord Shadow to be unfortunate, wondering how he was able to summon the most powerful witch in all of history. 
However, he believes Lord Shadow to be a lowly bandit, and assumes that he would be helpless against the supposedly powerful Aurora. Oh lord. You know what I'm thinking? Without wasting much time, Aurora launches multiple attacks on Lord Shadow, who spends his time avoiding them. Strategically, he runs around, biding his time and studying her, just before slicing her with his sword. The fact that Lord Shadow won so easily against someone he deemed so powerful surprises the acting Archbishop greatly. Just then, they are surprised to see a magical unveiling signifying the answer to Lord Shadow's call to the sanctuary. Witnessing this, Alpha is convinced even further. Later that night, Sid praises himself for a job well done on being the background character for the Shadow Eminence power. This happened to be what he used to defeat his opponent in the stadium. While doing so, a giant door appears. The giant red door with some mapping on it appeared below him, where he happened to be standing on a tall pillar. At first, he tries to avoid it by teleporting to another pillar, but yet, it appears again. Trying to avoid the door, he kept on moving from one place to another, but the door did not desist from appearing before him. Until finally, he decided to give it a try and see what's behind the door. Meanwhile, at the sanctuary, where we have Princess Alexia, Princess Rose and Miss Natsu, during the goddess's trial at the cathedral, the same giant door appears, making everyone wonder what it is. At first, they wonder what will come out of the door. Perhaps it might be a new warrior or a demon, they say. The behind them comes the archbishop, who is surprised at what he sees, saying probably the sanctuary responded to the shadow. Surprised at what he said, Princess Rose asked what he meant by responding, to which he explained that it is the day of the year when the sanctuary door is opened. However, a faint door appearing in the middle of the trial had never happened before which seems like a surprise to everyone. It is known that the door to the sanctuary is actually hidden in the cathedral, but is not just an ordinary door. The door is said to have the ability to change its shape and location at will, to respond to those who seek it, as well as to those who are worthy enough to pass through it. This door to the sanctuary is also said to have a forbidding door, beckoning door and a welcoming, with different forms and directions for it. But now, they can't tell which of the doors appeared before them. Just then, the door starts to open, telling everyone present on the trail to leave. This is because no one should go near the door, which eventually leads to the cancellation of the trail. As the Archbishop and the Princesses were about to leave the place, Lady Alpha and the Shadow Garden appeared in the cathedral, knocking out the guards and threatening the Princesses and the Bishop to keep their cool till the door closes. Just then, Lady Alpha and some of the cults disappear through the door. But then, Beta tries to take the Archbishop along with her. But as the ladies were about to defend him, Miss Natsum was captured and a sword was being placed on her neck, as a way to threaten others not to do anything. Princess Alexia, who happens not to be a very nice person, tells Princess Rose they should probably just let Miss Natsum die. But she refuses, and Miss Natsum also tells them to leave her and take care of themselves instead, which Beta knows she's just showing off. Just when Beta asks for the Archbishop and Miss Natsum to be taken along with them, which the Archbishop plainly refuses, saying that would be in the afterlife. Suddenly, a flash of a sword appears, which seems to have attacked Beta, but she manages to dodge it. But not completely, as two balls are seen floating in the air, which eventually happen to be Beta's chest. Meanwhile, her body has the ability to cut and join back together, which made it take its place. Then, within a twinkle of an eye, a flash of swords took place, and in the end, the victim happened to be the executioner Venom who had come to help the Archbishop. Beta happens to be the one who killed the Venom. The Archbishop is shocked at what just happened, and at the same time, Beta is also very angry, as light beams from her eyes. She asks with so much anger in her eyes if the Archbishop saw anything. In response, he denies seeing anything. Yet, she drags him, as she flies into the door with him, followed by the other remaining cult members who took Miss Natsum with them. The princesses seemed so confused at this, as they wondered what the Archbishop might have seen. They couldn't get a hold of what happened themselves. Knowing they can't leave Miss Natsum, Princess Alexia quickly follows them into the door, even when an unknown voice tells her not to, whereby Princess Rose, because of her sister, enters the door too before it closes completely. Entering the door, they happen to find themselves in the sanctuary, where, according to legend, it is where they sealed the left arm of the demon Diablos. There is also Lady Alpha, her cult members, Miss Natsum and the Archbishop. There, Lady Alpha explains the left arm of the demon Diablos was sealed there, after he was defeated by Hero Olivier. The Archbishop seems annoyed by this, as he asks Lady Alpha if she's there to tell fairy tales or there the demons are. Lady Alpha tells him, they are actually there to learn about the cult of Diablos. The Archbishop seems surprised at this, and she tells him she knows he can't answer any questions, which is why they have come themselves. Meanwhile, Lady Alpha and her cult have come there knowing to know everything about the demon Diablos and Hero Olivier from the beginning. There is the real statue of Hero Olivier. To their surprise, the hero happens to be a woman, different from the male statue they have in the city. What? What the f- 
Lady Alpha tells them that they know the true history of the Diablo's cult and the cult's objectives. To shock them all, Lady Alpha reveals her face, and to their surprise, she looks exactly like the hero Olivier. Seeing this, the Archbishop screams that she's a possessed elf, who should be dead. Lady Alpha appears behind him, asking if he knows anything about them, which he couldn't say but tremble in fear. Lady Alpha says that they also know the tales of the possessed, therefore they must be a nuisance to a church that is so eager to maintain the way of things. Princess Rose seemed confused, as she couldn't comprehend what she was trying to talk about. To help the situation, Lady Alpha explains that they found out the goal of the cult of Diablos, which is to bring the left arm back to life. However, they are yet to find out the true goal of the cult. She then proposed the idea of going in for everyone to find out themselves. To open the door to the memory graveyard, Lady Alpha places her hand on a door, whereby her hand ignites the powers of the door to be revealed, as some patterns are shown, as the door gradually unlocks. Suddenly, a great machine gets loosened, making way for the Vodex to open, with water gushing in and a very bright light coming from the outside. This comes as a surprise to the Archbishop, who wonders how it was possible for her to get the door opened. Lady Alpha, in a way to help his thoughts, tells him that the demon's magical power and warriors who fought a great battle behind the gate had come together to open the door. The vortex is said to lock away memories that have nowhere else to go. Lady Alpha explains that where they are is a graveyard of ancient memories and demonic grudges. There, in the light, is the hero Olivier as they start their journey into the memories. Meanwhile, on the other hand, Sid, after entering the giant door, gets into a room where he finds Gamma tied to a chair. He asked if she was the one who summoned him there, but she replied by saying no. She then makes mention of the fight they fought some time ago, saying she had fun fighting him, which he did too. Though she tells him her memories are incomplete, she knows he was the strongest during the fight. She asked how he got into the memories, which made him explain his encounter with the giant door only for him to find himself there. He also asked how she got there, and she gave an account of having no memory of leaving when she fought him, whereby the only thing she remembered was finding herself where she is now. Seeing he has nothing to do there, Sid tries to take his leave without freeing her from the bondage she is. But she stops him to at least help her untie after seeing her tied up and wearing a straitjacket, which he did with his sword. And in the process of cutting her loose, he also tore the straitjacket into shreds, leaving her with no clothes on. She makes mention of having tied it up for a thousand years, which she said she's not sure it's up to that. But what she knows is, she has been tied up for a while now. Then, within a twinkle of an eye, her straight jacket transformed into new clothes and heels, making her look all nice. Finally freed, she tells Sid to work together with her, since he wants to get out and she wants to be free from where she is too. Although, she said she knows how to free herself, even though she has never left the room before. She tells him the sanctuary, where they are, is a memory prison, created from ancient battles. And only if they go to the center and destroy its magical core is that she will be free to get out. Meanwhile, what she meant is that, once the magical core is destroyed, everything will disappear, which will help Sid get out too. Due to this, the sanctuary will be no more, but she doesn't seem to care about it. Gamma informs him of their inability to use their magic powers there, which means they are close to the center of the sanctuary. Even if they try to use their powers, it won't work out well. But then, Sid says he's good at breaking stuff if they are unable to use magic. Seeing how reliable Sid is, she tells him she has always wanted a gallant knight to protect her, because she's just a pretty, delicate lady in distress. Sid asks what she will do after getting free as they walk out of the room, and she replies she will only vanish into nothing, as he closes the door. On the other hand, Lady and her rest are also having their tour in the sanctuary, where they get to see through the hero, Olivier's memory that has been locked up in the sanctuary. In the memory, they find out that long ago, the cult gathered children in a big place that looked like a hospital or, better still, a rehabilitation center. There, they used them for experiments. Though some of the children died from this experiment, only a few survived, and they are known as the possessed. Meanwhile, the hero, Olivier, is one of the children who was compatible with the demon, Diablo's cells, which was given to them to take in. Shockingly, the Archbishop was one of the cult members who did these bad things. However, he does feel remorse as he says it is for them to be able to beat the demon Diablos. Although this is said to be the cult's excuse, the fact is that Olivier severs the demon's arm, which means it's not just a fairy tale. Meanwhile, where they are has changed over time from the battle that occurred, whereby memories are faded through time and replaced with new ones. Olivier was given a mission to extract new cells from Diablos as soon as she became mature enough. This, the Archbishop says, is not true, but Lady Alpha continues with her explanation. Olivier is said to be obedient, even after she has obtained powers. She believes, if she carried out this assignment given to her, people would be able to live in peace. But she was wrong, as she only ended up on a battlefield, with lots of dead people, whereby no matter how cute the demon is, he still lived. The demon killed many people, which made the cult use ancient artifacts to immobilize the left arm. They researched it by cutting into its flesh and drawing its blood and through this they were able to get small red beads which they took in. 
However, the side effect of the seed is too strong, which the cults find wrong. Suddenly, they put themselves in front of the demon's concealed arm, which is in a very huge glass with fluids in it and the arm chained. The archbishop feels distressed by this, as he yells at them for revealing the memory of him taking the beads, derived from Diablo's blood, which is said to give great powers and ageless immortality. This happens to be what the cult actually wants. Lady Alpha reveals Priest Nelson to the princesses, who have been quiet all this time, making him rant about what he went through with the cult. The bead is said to be taken once a year, or the eagle effect will wear off. Therefore, they can only make a small quantity of 12 of it a year, which happens to be the same as the number of members in the Knight of Round cult. Lady Alpha tells them that the beads of Diablos are yet to be perfected, as they assume the only way is to immobilize the demon's limb, the hero's descendant. Just then, Lady Alpha happens to be Olivier's descendant, as she asks the Archbishop to prove her wrong. The priest tells her what the cult needs, which is eternal life and power, and he agrees he's one of the Knights of Rounds, as he cut loss, making Delta stab him from behind. This happens to be the end of the Archbishop, as she throws him into the water below them. Delta apologizes for this because she has been told not to kill him till they get what they want from him. To their surprise, the Archbishop did not actually die, as he gets out of the water as a giant and disrupts the memories, which, in the process, separates the ladies. They all find themselves in an all-white hall, which Lady Alpha presumes is another feature of the sanctuary security system. Meanwhile, the Archbishop, as well as the Knight of Rounds are also there, as they get ready to get into battle with the ladies. The girls of the Shadow Garden see that everywhere is white, and they cannot see Epsilon anywhere they realize that they have been separated, which is another feature of the Sanctuary security system. Alpha leads them to fight against Nelson, who is empowered and strong-willed. Nelson tells them that the Sanctuary is their territory, and they will feel their wrath. He turns into several copies of himself to fight them and Delta engages him. She quickly cuts down the copies of Nelson that surrounded her and began to fight him. But, she realizes that something is not right. Nelson tells her that he baited them to be where he wants them to be, because the more they neared the center of the sanctuary, the more their strength will drain away. Alpha thoughtfully adds that while their power drains away, Nelson gains more power the more he nears the center of the sanctuary. Nelson was hoping that he could get them closer to the center, before starting his attack. But he concludes that the much they have covered will be enough. At once, his copies regain life to fight with Delta again. Meanwhile, Sid and Aurora find themselves in a sort of dark hall with no sense of up and down. Sid tells Aurora and she tells him to try not to look up or down. As they continue to walk, a sudden burst of light appears from behind them, which takes them to another memory. Sid and Aurora appear in a place, with Aurora sitting on him and he complains that she is heavy. but she waves him off that he is imagining it as punishment for goofing away. When he looks around, he sees that a battle has most likely taken place in the barring land. What remains are dead bodies and weapons everywhere around the field. Sid thinks to himself that the battlefield is devoid of home, but what they do not know is that an eminence intervenes from the shadows. He continues to maintain the upside-down position that they arrived in, but Aurora holds out a hand to draw him up. Sid and Aurora walk forward towards an abandoned pit, by stepping on the dead bodies on their path. Inside the pit, Aurora finds her younger self in the pit and Sid noticed that she was in tears. Aurora tells him that she was a crybaby, and asks for his sword. Sid gives her his sword, and she attempts to end her younger self, but as she approached her younger self inside the pit, the dead bodies instantly come alive, to attack her. Sid swiftly reaches out to Aurora and scoops her in his arms to shield her away from the attack. Sid steps on one of the awakened bodies to escape to the other side and Aurora tells him that it is becoming frustrating because the sanctuary is rejecting them. Sid wonders if they are like a virus caught by an antivirus software, and Aurora tells him that his analogy is unclear. The awakened bodies began to near them inside the pit, and he asks her what will happen if she dies there. Aurora thinks that she will be sent back to the first room. They both agree that if she will truly return to the first room, it will be tiresome. Epsilon's group walks through the place, and as they advance they encounter a sick person. 
The group stops and assumes a fighting position, but she waves them back and steps forward to meet the person. As she approached, the sick person disappears through her, which shocks them all. Epsilon explains that it is probably something similar to the goddess trial, which is like a memory that reacted to them and materialized. One of her members asked what she meant by the reaction to them and she explained that it reacted to those who are possessed. As they went through the place, they found an archive with information and a narrow room filled with different books and they go through the books together. They see flashes of memories, and she tells the others that the information they uncovered is seen in the flashes they just hard would have been their fate if they had not met Lord Shadow. Epsilon reminds her companions that all they have seen are just memories, and it would be difficult to carry them back. But, Etia had created a Polaroid camera, and with it, they took shots of as much information as they could take back with them. Epsilon reminds them that they owe everything to the wisdom of Lord Shadow, and they got to work. Epsilon's group began to experience a strange occurrence, and she tells them that it will not make it easy for them since their magic drains the more they approach the center of the sanctuary. One of the members mentions that it was the same occurrence that they had experienced at the academy and Epsilon urged everyone to manage their magic. Meanwhile, Sid and Aurora are defeating the awakened bodies. Sid tells Aurora that she is not the best fighter without her magic and she retorts that she is only a damsel in distress. She tells Sid that he is doing well without magic, and he reveals that he is finding it easy because he has been training and doing some bodybuilding since he has been a kid. Sid tells her that he does not hate the god mode they are currently in, but with magic, they can go on forever. Sid quickly kills the younger Aurora with an apology to end the memory which brings them back to a vast room. That was illuminated with a bright light. Looking around, he tells Aurora that the place is huge and just beyond him, he sees a beautiful place, and she tells him that it is the center of the sanctuary. Delta continues to fight Nelson, and even though she is no match for him, he is surprised that she is still fighting because her magic is supposed to be limited. With a crazed look, Delta finishes more copies of Nelson, and she stands in the middle of all the bodies to access her work. Nelson asks her if she awakened all on her own since the technique has been lost for ages. Fearfully, he tells her that he is prepared for her level of resistance, and he decides to show his full power. Nelson makes more copies of himself for the fight, and Aurora takes him by surprise with her fierceness. A blinding bolt of light covers her in waves, and with a scream, she goes for another attack. Sid asks Aurora what they were supposed to be destroying in the room, and she tells him that it is the magic core which is on the other side of a door barricaded with several chains. He tries to see if breaking the chains will let them through, but he cannot do it with his sword because it will likely break off first before the chain will give way. Aurora asks him if he did not think that there is a key to open the door, and he walks to her. In front of her, he sees a shiny sword, and she tells him that it is written on it and that the sword can cut the chains. Sid moves closer to see a blazing red right up on the sword, and he tells Aurora that he would be unable to use the sword. He attempts to lift it from its hold, but the sword strongly rejects him. Sid and the sword began to shake violently, and he tells Aurora that the sword can only be moved by the Chosen One. Aurora kneels by the side of the sword to examine it, and she tells him that the Holy Sword can only be drawn by direct descendants. She points out the holy inscription that is written on it, and she is impressed that it only took him a single glance to read what it meant. Sid draws back from trying to force the sword out of its hold, and he tells her that he is well versed in all the standard formulas. Aurora asks him if it means that he has knowledge of all the countless magical script patterns and has memorized them, and he tells her that he has. Sid asks Aurora what they can do next, but there is no instruction written there for them to follow. With no way to open the door, Aurora and Sid sat down together beside the sword. Delta continues to fight with Nelson. Alexa watches the fight from the side, and wonders if she is truly working for Shadow because his fighting style is nothing compared to his. Alexa reveals that when she met Shadow, his style was extremely sophisticated, unlike what Delta is displaying which lacks sophistication or technique but is rather an unbridled violence. Delta defeats another copy of Nelson to break the memory, and he is surprised that she fought over a hundred cloned versions of himself without breaking a sweat. It's only game. Why do you have to be mad? Delta assumes that he was once a scientist, and she tells him that even if he makes as many copies as possible, they will always have one brain which is not nearly sufficient to control all the bodies. Even if the bodies are a thousand, unless they can move freely, she tells him that they are no better than scarecrows. Nelson fearfully draws back from Aurora, and he hits a statue of Olivier. He looks up at the statue and starts to bang on it, calling Olivier to come down and help him. In a dazzle of red light, Olivier emerges to answer Nelson's call, and he begins to laugh at his victory. From above, Epsilon calls out to Alpha just as she recognized Olivier, that they have concluded the investigation, so they can leave. Alpha announces that in that case, they can excuse themselves and Nelson is surprised that they are leaving. Alpha tells him that they are not running away, but they have no interest in people like him or uncertain memories because their only objective was to cut off the source of power. As they make their exit, she tells him that they now know how the defenses of the sanctuary work, and the next time they visit, it will be at a time of their choosing.
Nelson threatens that he will not let them go easily, but Alpha pays him no mind. Instead, she invites Delta and Alexia with the other ladies to join them in leaving the place. After Alpha leaves with the ladies, Nelson wonders what his story will be, and he comforts himself with the fact that he got to look at Alpha's face so if they can get her blood, they will be much closer to perfecting the bead. He reasons that he will tell the other factions that he lured them to the sanctuary in a trap to expose their real identities. As he continued his rants about a possible reward for his actions, he receives a notification that there are people at the center of the sanctuary. He decides to let off some steam with the people that have wandered into the sanctuary's center and orders Olivier to follow him. At the center of the sanctuary, Sid asks Aurora about her intentions to disappear because she had mentioned that after destroying the core, she will disappear. Aurora tells him that rather than disappear, it will be more accurate to say that she will be set free from the prison of memories that repeats into eternity, and it is a little too much for her. Sid prompts her to give it a little more time and things will work out. Sid wonders to himself that according to the formula, it is about time for the story's protagonist to make an entrance. Just then, Nelson appears before them and Sid jumps up excitedly, thinking that it is the hero's direct descendant who has the power to draw up the sword. But, Sid sees a bald Nelson and he is surprised that it is not whom he thinks. He wonders if it is one of those times when the bad man appears to stop the protagonist. Sid sees that Olivier looks like Alpha, but he quickly recognizes that she is not Alpha. Nelson recognizes Aurora and he asks Sid how he brought her out of her cage while referring to her as a witch. Sid is surprised that Nelson knows Aurora and he asks her if she knows him but Aurora has no memory of Nelson which makes him mock her. Nelson tells Sid that he would not allow someone like him to access the door, and he sends Olivier to fight him. Sid understands that all Olivier is strong, and she has no heart. They began to fight and Aurora begs him to stop, that she will do whatever Nelson wants to save Sid's life but Sid challenges Olivier and stabs Sid. Sid opens his right eye which has been closed, telling them that he got them. Sid grabs Olivier and draws her closer to himself. He bites her neck, ripping it apart and defeating her. Before Nelson's eyes, Olivier crumbles to the floor and Sid gives off a hearty laughter, which shocks Aurora. Hakar. Hakar. Nelson asks Sid how he survived because he watched Olivier stab him in the gut and Sid tells him that as long as the vitals are protected, the human body is surprisingly sturdy. Therefore, even if anyone gets stabbed in the gut, the trick is to protect the arteries and important organs, and the person will be safe. Sid removes the sword from his body and throws it aside, and he asks Nelson if he thinks it is a beautiful thing to avoid the trouble of dodging the enemy's attack by simply protecting his vitals. Nelson perspires from the shock of everything he is witnessing, and he is almost unable to talk coherently. Sid continues his carefree description of avoiding the enemy's attack by telling Nelson that once the attacker stabs his belly, he gets the chance to bite into the person's neck, which gives him the perfect position for a good counter-attack. Nelson tells Sid that he is not sure Sid is okay in the head. Sid pays him no mind for the insult. Instead, he tells Nelson that since Olivier has been defeated, they will continue the fight. Nelson begins to beg Sid that they do not have to fight, but they can simply talk everything out. Sid pays deaf ears to his pleas and continues to approach him. As Sid nears the middle of the arena, Nelson sarcastically says that Sid is expecting him to beg in fear, but he will not beg. He admits that he is surprised that someone like Sid who is unable to use magic defeated Olivier. But he considers it as Sid's luck and tells him that all he achieved was beat one copy, so he told him congratulations. Just as Sid begins to respond with a thank you, Nelson cuts him short and tells Sid that he has not achieved anything because there is so much magical energy lying dormant in the sanctuary that they cannot even fathom what to do with it which means he can do more. Nelson commands his powers and he creates many copies of Olivier to attack Sid. Every inch of the sanctuary's walls is covered with copies of Olivier, set to attack Sid. Sid takes his time to look around and acknowledge all the superhuman bodies created to fight him, and he tells Nelson that his time is up. He opens his right eye again, and a blue light emits from it. Nelson's creation shatters before his eyes under Sid's powers which surprises him. Nelson stares in disbelief at the solid mass of magic energy that Sid is controlling and wonders how since Sid cannot use magic. Nelson tries to think of several ways to justify what is taking place in front of him and he considers that it is either slime or an artifact, but Sid explains to him that if trying to use magic gets it absorbed, then he just has to temper the magic until it is too solid to be absorbed. The blue light vanishes from his eyes, and he tells Nelson that it took a bit of time to master it, but it is really simple. Aurora is surprised at this fact, and Nelson deems it an impossible feat to be achieved by any human. Once again, Nelson commands Olivier in her various copies to attack Sid. Sid mocks him that his moves are even too tedious than before and the copies are now moving like scarecrows. Sid engages the copies for a bit while Nelson keeps commanding that they should kill him. Suddenly, Sid announces that playtime is over. He asks Aurora the steps for the mission again to draw the holy sword, cut the chains and destroy the magical core and she affirms it. 
Aurora tries to stop him from doing anything but he tells her that it is only a pain to try to fulfill every step so they will just blast through all of them at once, which will still lead to the same result. The color of the entire place changes to a dim purple shade, and Aurora looks up to see what Sid was doing. As she continues to look, she wonders how one person could be afforded so much power. Sid begins to cast his ultimate spell, but before he could finish the last words, one of Olivier's copies stabs him in the heart. Sid continues to bleed, but he is unaffected by it or the new stab to his heart. Instead, he finishes his spell and in a terrific blast of magic, a heavy explosion rocks the entire place. It crushes all the copies of Olivier's and destroys all the chain doors and everything in the room. Even the ladies with Alexia are in awe of what happened as a mighty explosion erupts from a water body and explodes into the air, taking everything with it. Sid appears in a dark place with his sword, and he sees a red glowing chain, raising his sword to strike. He is transported to another vision. There, he wakes up to meet himself laying at Aurora's feet in a forest, and she asks him how he managed to survive a stab to his heart. Sid rises to a sitting position to talk to her, and he reveals that he used magic to move his heart to another side. Sid admits that he is now tired, and Aurora tells him that he is full of surprises. As she begins to touch his wound, Sid notices that she is disappearing. Aurora becomes withdrawn, and she settles down to talk to Sid. She reveals that she was the one that called him there. She apologizes for lying to him, and he tells her that it is okay. She continues by telling him that it is not the only thing she lied about. Aurora confesses that for so long, all she has wanted was to fade into nothing and forget everything. She turns to Sid, to look into his eyes as she tells him that she has now made a memory that she does not want to forget. She tells him that even if she disappears, she wants to hold on to the memory without letting it disappear. She thanked him for the precious memory, and Sid equally thanks her for the good time that he has had. Aurora begins to tell him about what he must do if he ever finds her real self, but she disappears before she could complete the statement, leaving Sid alone. I don't like where this is going. After a while, Sid stands up to walk around. Meanwhile, Alexia and her companions continue on their way after what they have witnessed. They speculate that it was probably shadows, but they abruptly stop moving. Alexia feels frustrated that they could not do anything and specifically thinks that she thought she has accepted the fact that she is powerless. But now, she feels like there is more to that because she could not decode who is right or wrong, or even judge between good and evil. Alexia laments that she could do nothing but stand and watch as a spectator, and if everything continues that way, she fears that she may lose all her loved ones before she can even decode that they are in danger. Rose responds that she has been thinking ever since the Academy was attacked that there may be big organizations working in the shadows, but they do not know anything about the Shadow Garden or the big organizations they are at war with. Natsum chips into the conversation and asks Alexia what they should do. Alexia admits that they are weak and ignorant, but if they all work together, they should be able to achieve something. Since Alexia and Rose are princesses, she feels that they can use that to their advantage and Natsum can use her connection as an author to also help out. They agree that the three of them will join forces to gather information and also fight back. With the information, they could recruit allies to work for them and possibly establish a base for operations. After going back and forth and sharing their fears about their barely solid plan, they join hands to form a team and each person vows to contribute as much help as they can to reveal the truth to the world. On a boat ride, Epsilon reports to Alpha that the sanctuary has been destroyed. The Holy Sword and Magical Core have both vaporized, with no samples remaining. Alpha tells her that it is the simplest and most reliable solution to the matter, and they both agree that no other person could have achieved that except Lord Shadow, because the style is more like him. Alpha tells Epsilon that the path he follows is the path they must follow as well. Epsilon reports that Beta is watching over the princesses, and if she plays her cards right, she may be able to enter their inner circle. They discuss Aurora, and Epsilon confirms that their theory that Aurora the Witch of Calamity has another name is correct. This reveals that Aurora's other name is Demon Diablos. Alexia informs her of the stage for their next performance and tells her that there will be no need to inform Lord Shadow because he knows everything. Meanwhile, a man tries to convince Luna to buy a property and build a shopping center there. He offers her a discount because he would like to have her in their city and lists the benefits of getting the place to her. Luna does not take the idea at first, and the man continues to make her see reasons. Just then, one of her employees comes in with a report from the survey of the area for Luna. She whispers to her boss that there is a deposit of petroleum on the land, and Luna takes the offer. Luna offers to buy every property on the street, to help him build his dream city which seals the deal. Alpha asks of Delta and she discovers that Delta may still be in the sacred land. She tells the others not to worry about her and that she will return to them when she gets cold outside. 
She remembers a fond memory shared with Sidib when they completed their temporary base, and she announced that the girls may now commence training for the operation they have. She tells him that if they are going to fight the cult of Diablos, they will need all the strength and training they can get. Alpha gets lost in these memories, but she snaps out of it when she gets a message from the Oriana Kingdom. They reveal that the Royal Chancellor Perv Ashat will be visiting the royal capital of Midgar. Alexia explains to Iris what transpired between the dead Archbishop and the new one. She tells Iris that both the murdered Archbishop and the new one are a member of a cult. While she knows all this, she does not know more than that to help them but if they can get to the sanctuary, they may get some but they do not have access to such a big place. To her, a facility of that size can ordinarily not be kept hidden without a type of support or considerable influence from the public sphere. She tells Iris that if they are looking for an organization with that sort of influence, they will need to forget diplomacy and investigate the divine teachings. Alexia begins to suggest a way to tie the situation to the capital but Iris cuts her off. Iris reveals each time she tries to bring it up with their father, the king he pays no mind to it. Instead, he always tells her not to make a move. Iris suggests to Alexia that they could use the upcoming Bushin festival to their advantage. She will compete and win a tournament, which will get everyone's attention and make her father listen to them but Alexia's eyes widen in fear. At every big event, the Shadow Garden and Diablos are always working behind the scenes. She worries that they may be planning something especially since the annual Bushin Festival is around the corner. Iris tells her not to worry, because she has the perfect sword skills to fight, and she will not be defeated. Alexia tells Iris that artifacts are not the only weapons they have in their arsenal, and she reminds her of the magical light that engulfed the capital. After Alexia leaves the room, Iris goes over her support which is not much because the Night Order is no longer supporting her after she took their strongest members to their death, but she knows she must win against the cult in Shadow Garden. Iris begins to hear distinct noises, and she listens in. In a lonely area, Rose starts to train, but she is restless while at it. It's time for the Bushin Festival, where all strong people come to showcase their strength in a combat competition. During this competition, the Black Knight of the Oriana Kingdom, Volgata Kingdom, including fighters from the East, came to honor this event. Since the festival is unified in the quest to find the strongest among them, Sid decides to join. He decides to join the competition, because he feels the sponsors, fighters and spectators of the competition are after one thing, which is absolute strength. Therefore, being a very strong and powerful young man, he would like to showcase his strength. Thereby, people would get amazed at what he can do, which is one of the things to do on his eminence shadow bucket list, but not with his true identity. In Oriana's palace, Gamma enters the palace hall, only for her to find Sid standing by the window as she walks to appreciate him for gracing the palace establishment, and as well ask him what he has come to do. Suddenly, she trips, falling on her face. The maid comes to take care of her nose bleed from the falling, as she talks to Sid. To get straight to the point, Sid, who is now seated on a high throne, tells her his intention to disguise himself to join the Bushin festival. Gamma, who seemed surprised, asked why he wanted to disguise himself, but he chose to keep it a secret from her. Immediately, the disguise preparation starts, as rows of clothes are brought for him to choose from. Gamma then moves close to him to rub slime on his face, which she says when charged with magical energy, changes to a texture that is every bit as real as a human skin. To make this slime transform him into whoever he wants, he is asked to pick a picture of who he wants, and eventually picks Mundane Man. Mundane Man happens to be a lazy dark knight with no skill to speak of, which makes him the best option for Sid, as he wants a weak person to disguise himself. Then a machine is being controlled to cover his whole head, which after some seconds transforms him into Mundane Man. Despite looking so weak in the face, he decides to change his posture too, to make people see him as very weak. He walks down the stairs to pick up clothes that suit his new appearance. Meanwhile, Gamma, while walking down the stairs and telling him he will need clothing and a sword, trips again. She falls down the stairs with blood dripping from her nose. On the street, while three men talk, one of them cites a lady who is dressed in metal armor walking toward them. One of the men, with surprise, recognizes her as Anaros from Velgalta's Seven Blades. She is known to be the one who supposedly summoned an ancient warrior at the last goddess trial that took place some time ago, and spoke greatly of her. Meanwhile, Sid, who is not known as Mungane Man, walks past them, then surprisingly, the lady stops him, saying she's quite sure he's not planning on competing in the Bushin Festival. With the aim of helping him, she tells him to erase that idea from his head and go back to him, because he looks so sick and weak. But instead, Sid tells her not to judge a book by its cover, and tells her he doesn't need her help, while he walks away. While walking away and feeling happy about his right choice of disguise, a hefty man named Quentin stops him. Quentin boasts of having participated in the competition a few times before now, and tells Sid to heed to advice when given one. He tells him to go back home to his mummy, because every time he participates, there are always weak ones like him who ruin the fun of the festival, 
which makes everyone around laugh at Sid. In response to everything Quentin said, Sid made it known to him that he was at least stronger than him. <laughs> this is because these words make Quentin so angry, which makes him punch Sid hard. The hard punch made, which, like a wind force, pushed Sid and made him crash hard on the ground. <laughs> While Quentin charges at Sid for pouncing on him, Sid, on the other hand, thinks of how much of an amateur Quentin is, and how he can defeat him. But instead, he decides to leave him be, since he doesn't want to waste his energy on someone like him, before getting to the festival. This gives Quentin the opportunity to beat him to pulp by trashing him with some punches here and there, while others lament about what a loser he is. Quentin wonders why he didn't bother to fight back at all, which Sid replies he doesn't want to waste his fist on a low-level street fighter like him. This made Quentin angrily step on his head. Finally, Anero steps in and makes him to stop the fight or she will be forced to step in and fight him, which makes him leave the Sid and walk away. She moves close to Sid, who looks almost out of life, and apologizes for what happened, saying she didn't know it would get out of hands like that. Sid, who doesn't see why she apologizes, tells her she could have stopped him from being beaten from the start if she wanted to, but she didn't. She then explains to him that she feels it is better he gets beaten now than to get a permanent injury in the competition. Therefore, she advises him to go back home, as it is obvious from what happened now that he won't make it through the festival. And to her surprise, after seeing how Hale, he stood up from the ground and made her ask if he wasn't hurt at all, but he didn't answer as he walked away. He states that it had been a long time since he tasted blood. As he walks away, she stops him to introduce herself, which he acknowledges and introduces himself as mundane man without looking back, and proceeds to walk away. At the location of the tournament, while lined up to be called into the arena, Sid expressed his achievement at having been able to gain Anaros's sympathy. And this time, he thinks of himself when he enters the ring to fight, whereby people will think he can't fight but he will show them how strong he is with their jaws dropped. This reaction of his to his thinking made people move away from him, until his name was called to enter into the arena. The day before the Bushin festival, he and his friend discussed how the tournament would go in a restaurant. There is talk about the tournament starting with preliminaries, and only the toughest fighter from this stage will get into the main event. To him, that is the only time for him to show his eminent power, and to achieve this, he just has to fight like he does, he thinks to himself. Now his worry is how to approach the prelims, which his friend agrees to, mentioning the fact that people's bet on the fighter won't be effective until the main tournament. However, if they want to win, they have to collect data from the earlier fight to know how the main tournament will be. Then, during the discussion, Sid makes mention of Quentin as a repeat competitor who he has his eyes on. Although he would like to fight with him, it might not be easy, but he would like to. He tells his friend this aim of his calls for careful observation. Though Yup, who thinks Sid has been talking about betting on the fighter, agrees with him, saying it is important they guess right the first time, in order to win good. Sid, during the conversation, casually asks his friend who he thinks will most likely win the tournament, then Yup replies, saying, it has to be Princess Iris, who is known to be skilled and powerful too. If she wins this year's tournament, she will become the first repeat champion in ages. He gives another contestant, who is the student council president, Princess Rose, who gets included by winning the school's tournament. She happens to be the first Bushin champion from the Oriana Kingdom. To conclude his analysis, Yup tells Sid that, if they intend to make enough money from this tournament, they would need enough money too, to be able to place bets and win big. Instead of replying to Yup, Sid asks if there is anyone else. Finally, Yup gets to mention two more great fighters he knows. While about to ask for funds for his betting, Sid cuts Yup short by giving him a gift he got from Lindworm and leaves. He, however, orders sandwiches before stepping out. Late in the night, while walking back home, Sid thinks about fighting one of those mentioned by Yup, as it will be an avenue to attract attention. Suddenly, Princess Rose appears behind him, making him question what she's doing out this late dressed casually like she did and she replies she's going to meet someone later. Seeing the pack with him, she tells him, she, Princess Alexia, Miss Natsum Kafta went to the restaurant some time ago to eat, which Sid finds awkward. She explains that she's not close to Miss Natsum and Princess Alexia happens to be a very nice girl. She then hopes they become best of friends soon and work together to make the world a better place. But Sid doesn't seem to be in support of this as he thinks to himself, wondering that there is nothing Princess Rose can do to make Princess Alexia her friend as long as she thinks she's nice. Princess Rose tells her that Princess Alexia and Miss Natsum are somewhat awkward around each other. Then, seeing that it is already getting late, Sid asks her if she shouldn't be on her way now, since she's going to see someone. This made her confess that she's actually meeting with her father who wants to introduce her to her finances, Lord Perf. Sid congratulates her, but she doesn't seem happy about it. She begins to tell him how people have had great expectations for her, her entire life due to her being a princess, but then she failed them. 
Being a princess with great expectations, she decides to choose the part of the sword. Sid decides to share his own knowledge of hearing that the Dark Knight doesn't rank very high in the Oriana hierarchy. However, her father and everyone in the kingdom were against the path she had chosen. They were against it because they couldn't see the reason why she would choose the dirt and sweat which didn't suit her background. But then, she explains she decided to choose this part because of her encounter with a knight during a war she witnessed. With sadness in her eyes, she talked about the possibility of her betraying countless people by her decisions. And to know if some still believes in her, she asks Sid to find out who is already eating his sandwich, if he would believe in her no matter what. To make her happy, he gives her a positive reply, which she appreciates and makes to walk away before Sid decides to throw a sandwich, asking her to try and relax a little, as they both depart. Finally, it's the day to pick those participating for the main event, whereby lots of men are there to participate, better watch. The festival has started and winners have been made from the fights fought earlier. Sid and Yup are there as well, where Yup is busy collecting data on the battles fought to be able to know how to place his bet. During the fight, a man, Goldie Gilded, known as the Unbeaten Legend, arrives, with Yup praising him, as Sid looks confused about not knowing him. Golden, who likes to be referred to as Professor Goldie, boasts to Yup how he never fails to tabulate data. This, he says, is made easy for him because he can see the fighter's energy level with his eyes, which makes him know whom he should place his bet on. Meanwhile, it's almost time for Sid to fight, as he leaves Yup and Professor Goldie to go in disguise as Mundane Man. He is placed to fight against a very hefty man, Gonzal, whom everyone thinks will beat Sid. Goldie thinks Sid will be defeated because of how weak he looks and his energy level is just 33. But to their surprise, CIA defeated Gonzal within a twinkle of an eye, which made him the winner. Meanwhile, Anaros also witnessed the battle and was surprised as to how Sid was able to defeat the hefty man with just a single punch on the chin. Seeing this, Professor Goldie tells Yup that he will be up against Sid in the next battle, thinking he will be unbeaten. Sid, after leaving the ring and announcing the winner, transforms into his normal self without no one noticing, which makes the end of the day. Later that night, while sleeping, Yup comes knocking on Sid's door with a newspaper in his hand. He informs Sid of Princess Rose's having stabbed her Lord Perv and ran away. Princess Alexia and Miss Natsum stay in the latter's office, making efforts to find Princess Rose. Eventually, they find out she has fled to the north side of the royal capital, which also means she might still be in the city. Miss Natsum explains to Princess Alexia about the fact that the Oriana Kingdom wants to settle the matter as a minor domestic issue, and they also sent word to the Midgar Kingdom not to interfere in this, as they would have to find their daughter themselves. With this new information, they both think foul play is being played, because Princess Rose is an exchange student which means it is only right that she is judged by the Midgar law. If this should happen, it would affect the relationship between the two kingdoms. It is said that Lord Perv is the second son of the Oriana Kingdom's duke, which means she would be given a very harsh punishment if she was arrested for harming him. But Princess Alexia tells Miss Natsum that, since Princess Rose is royalty, she can't be given the death penalty. Anyways, Princess Alexia finally gives her say to make sure Princess Rose is found and hears her own side of the story. But to make things clear, Miss Natsum informs her that Princess Rose has never mentioned anything about what's going on between her and her fiancé. This, in her opinion, might be because she doesn't want their involvement to lead to conflict between the two kingdoms, which would be reasonable for them to back down on the matter. But Princess Alexia declines this, as she doesn't think it is right to abandon her sister like that. Miss Natsum explains what she meant, as it is just for them to plan their moves well. This gets Princess Alexia angry, and makes her ask Miss Natsum if she's an idiot for saying they have to find her. Unable to give Princess Alexia an answer, it makes the princess very angry as she grabs her by the cloth, making the papers in her hands fall on the ground, as she begs for her life. Princess Alexia, who knows Miss Natan is faking, tells her she will kill her as she frees her to take her seat. She agrees to the fact that Princess Rose doesn't want to drag them into her problem. But then, they have to do something to help her, since they are sworn allies. Therefore, since they have decided to work together, it means they also have to help each other when needed. Princess Alexia tells Miss Natsum this, about what should be done, which she agrees to. She promises to gather information about her, as well as some rumors she heard about her fiancé. After that, Princess Alexia decides to leave the office, with the determination to do what she can to get her sister back home. Meanwhile, after Princess Alexia leaves, Miss Natsum invites a lady, Beatrix, who seems to be working secretly for her. In their conversation, she tells the lady to relay some information about Lord Perv and the Oriana royal family. To her, this is because the princess will be able to think before taking actions, when there are lots of things to process. Also, the lady who has been asked to find the whereabouts of Princess Rose, returns. She relays the information about the princess having made it an underground ruin. This place is a complex series of tunnels, which will make it the perfect place for her to hide. Having listened to the new update, Miss Natsum gave orders for her to be monitored. 
Any information about the princess should be taken note of and relayed to her. At last, the day for the Bushin festival has come, and everyone is seated in the arena, as the battle has begun. Sid and Yep are also among the crowd. However, Sid's mind isn't in the battle, but the newspaper in his hands, which has Princess Rose's incident in it. Then suddenly, he switches to his ambition of using his eminence shadow power to get what he wants, while Yup thinks about how to make a fortune from his betting. Sid thinks of a secret war unfolding at the scene of the tournament, which he feels is exactly what he will do, with his disguise, and disappears to get ready for his turn. While going to disguise, he comes across Beatix, the lady from Miss Natsum's office, who is wearing a hoodie. She stops the moment she walks past Sid, asking him if he knows a pretty elf girl, who happens to be her late sister's daughter because he smells of her. In order to make it clear to him, she tells him the girl looks like her, as she removes her hoodie after being told by Sid that he can't see her face with it on. Within Sid, he knows Lady Alpha is the one she's looking for, but instead, he decides to lie about not knowing anyone that looks like her. To find out if he's lying, she wields her sword toward him, which Sid pretends to be scared of as he falls. She apologizes for scaring him, as she lends a helping hand to draw him up, and tells him he has a good hand with good power, as she takes her leave into the arena. Anna Rose, while watching the battle, gets the company of Quentin, who has also come to watch the fight. They talk about Sid's win in the previous fight, and how he was able to defeat his hefty opponent which doesn't look like luck to Anna Rose. They continue their talks about how fast Sid was able to defeat his opponent with the twinkle of an eye. No one could even comprehend how he did it. But Anna Rose states that the only thing she can remember is that Sid's right hand moved, which might be what he defeated his opponent with. Although they thought he used some kind of magic to defeat his opponent earlier, Quentin says Sid's battle today will help them know the truth. Meanwhile, Sid's opponent will be Professor Goldie, who has never lost a single fight. Anna Rose then tells him that, although he has been matched to fight with him before, he didn't accept it because he doesn't like to fight with those he knows would defeat him. Now, the next round of fighters is called into the arena, with Sid, as mundane man and Professor Goldie step into the arena, waiting to start the fight. People give their comments on Sid's weak appearance, saying he shouldn't have come for the fight at all, but little did they know what he's capable of. Anna Rose wonders how Professor Goldie can't even see through Sid's energy to know how strong he is, but to him, Sid's energy is less than 30, which he thinks will make things easy for him. The fight starts, with Professor Goldie charging with full force to hit Sid with his sword. But to everyone's surprise, Sid dodges the sword very fast, and hits Professor Goldie with his sword base. This gets Anna Rose and Quentin talking, as they wonder how he got to escape the sword. Until Anna Rose explains what she thinks she saw, which is Sid tilting his neck to one side, like cracking it. This comes as a surprise to Quentin, as he doesn't want to believe what he has heard. Anna Rose explains further that it seems like a coincidence when the sword is being wielded at him, which makes it even more complex for them to believe. They both do not want to believe he is an ordinary human being as this does seem like a normal thing to do so fast, which is so hard for anyone to see. Seeing how humiliated he was, Goldie gets so angry as he moves back to get himself together, telling Sid he just missed a one in a million chance of winning him. However, he just missed that chance. He became very angry that Sid did not show any remorse for him to back down on going further and challenging him, as he started ranting at the top of his voice, telling Sid to get on the ground and beg him like the loser he is, whereby if he doesn't do that, it would be blasphemy to him. But Sid still decides to stand on his feet, waiting for him to show his worse. Seeing how annoying and proud his opponent is, Goldie unleashes his power dragon, which comes with a very bright golden light and then charges at Sid to end him at once. But to everyone's surprise again, Sid sneezes a second before the power consumes him, making the power vanish, and Goldie is blown away, crashing hard on the ground. Everyone looks in awe, as they can't believe their eyes, witnessing how powerful Sid is. Anna Rose doesn't seem to be satisfied, as she feels Sid doesn't give a clear visual manifestation of his magical powers. But yet, she wonders what he did at the last minute that made him defeat Goldie without touching him. And at last, she recollects how he sneezed, with his sword coincidentally pointing at the Goldie's power dragon. What? What the f to Sid, every second is an opening. This doesn't go down on Quentin, as he says that if Sid keeps winning, he would be up against him in the preliminary finals. And then, he would show the world who CIA really is. Eventually, Sid is announced the winner as he walks out of the arena with a weak face. Meanwhile, at Oriana Kingdom, Lord Perv, Princess Rose's fiancé, and Princess Iris, talk about the security for the Bushin tournament finals preparation. Princess Iris, who is surprised at his sudden healing, tells him what she sees now is different to the report she heard about him, whereby the report is exaggerated. This, Lord Perv takes as a joke, as he tells her they worry too much, and perhaps it will be blamed on Princess Alexia's kidnapping. The king, who is now seated, tells her how proud he was when Princess Iris went to rescue Princess Alexia single-handedly when kidnapped. Therefore, Lord Perv interferes, telling her they will handle their family issues within the family without external help, as he volunteers to handle them. 
This makes her very angry but she can't vent her anger as Lord Perv tries to get on her nerves. The following day, the fight continues in the arena as Sid defeats his opponent, Quentin who has come up against him, surprising people with his unexplainable powers. Meanwhile, some people talk about how he defeated Goldie the previous day, and now he has won again, which makes him qualify for the main tournament. Anaros also watches how he defeated Quintum, and decides to find out how he did it. After being announced in the winner, and walking out of the arena, Anaros waits for him underneath the arena passage, while he was passing by to go change. She tells him how she never thought he could meet at the main tournament, and congratulates him on that. Now, she asks him how he was able to beat those unbeatable men without having to waste his energy. Sid, however, who thinks she deserves an answer to that, decides not to give her an answer as he walks away. Anaros, who is determined to learn how he does it, stops him to show him she can as well crack her neck, but he ignores him as he looks away to continue walking. Princess Rose, while hidden, is found by some knights who have come to capture her, but she is able to flee after getting rid of some of them, as he runs down a dark passage. In the stadium, Sid falls to the ground as his opponent strikes him with the sword. His opponent tells him that he has only used a small unit of his power on Sid and he is weak. Sid begins to calculate and suddenly he wakes up in his room. He begins to say to himself that he is just getting the hang of the measures and he is starting to confuse himself and he needs to start working hard to master it. Suddenly, his friend came to his house and started knocking. Sid begins to complain about having many people around and how they can disturb plans and how friends would continue to seek the company of others even when it is not convenient for the person. His friend begins to yell at him that he has brought an offer for Sid. Sid opens the door and he begins to tell Sid that they will become rich, as student council president Rose is a wanted criminal. He tells Sid that they will get 10 million zen if they turn her in alive or they can get 500 if they can give the police any useful information. He also tells Sid that they should go and catch her as he shoves a flyer in his face. Sid walks away and asks his friend why. His friend answers that it is because he is broke and he needs money. Sid opens the window and begins to ask his friend about a bet he had staked and how he was sure that he was going to win it. Sid's friend begins to get hysterical and he pins Sid to the window and begins to yell that he really needs money. Sid begins to wonder and tells himself that he is in support of the president of the student council running away. He also admires her as she is a rebel who would try to kill a fiancé. Immediately, Sid goes inside and changes his clothes and he tells his friends that they should go and start the operation by finding the president of the student's council. Suddenly, Sid pulls his friend out throughout the window and they both fall into the bushes nearby. Soon they go to the train station and Sid begins to see the flyers of the president of the student's council being wanted. Sid says to himself that he needs to buy some time while he waits for his sister to cool her head. He also began to wonder if Rose got away safe and sound. He also thinks if he was given the opportunity, he would have asked her why she stabbed her fiancé. Soon, Sid starts to look at the people passing and he remembers how he was forced to learn the piano in his former life and how it has helped him to minimize his friends. He thinks the misunderstanding people have about people memorizing the piano helped him a lot, as people tend not to mind him at a time he is taking piano lessons, and he has been using that to his advantage. He also thinks about how he wanted to become the eminence in shadow. Sid begins to fantasize about the soothing sound of the piano, and how he would use it to create a mood for a battle. Sid begins to imagine himself playing a soundtrack while fighting battles as the eminence in shadow he feels it would create a dramatic effect for him. He also wonders how there is a moonlight sonata and he concludes that there must be someone that has been reincarnated. Sid goes inside a building where a piano is being played by a lady. He stays to enjoy the sound. He begins to list the songs she is playing and he admires her dress as he accesses her from her head to her toe and soon the lady finishes and the crowd claps for her. Later that day, the girl, Epsilon, sips tea with Sid while her servant brushes her hair for her. She tells him that she is so honored to have him to come and watch her play. He asks her if the piece she played was the Moonlight Sonata and she tells him yes as she liked the piece out of everything he had taught her. Sid begins to tell himself that he did not teach her anything and he also likes the fact that she likes what he also likes. Epsilon proceeds to thank Sid for her creating important connections with influential people, such as a pianist and a composer. She continues to tell him how she has collected awards for the songs he taught her. Sid says to himself that it is ridiculous to collect or give an award for a plagiarized song. Epsilon assured Sid that she would perform her duty and her music in a way worth of sublime masterpieces. Sid congratulates her and asks her if she knows where Oriana's Princess Rose ran off to and she tells Sid that Beta is in charge of the case, so she does not have any details about it. Epsilon then tells Sid that she has heard that Rose has taken refuge in the tunnels under the royal capital. Epsilon tells Sid that she can send someone to Beta but he tells her not to worry and he has gotten enough information from her. 
While he is leaving, Sid tells Epsilon that her figure looks good. She begins to blush and thanks him for being so humble. After leaving the room, Sid begins telling him that she told him something nice. Due to this, he also decided to tell him something that would make her happy. At the train station, Alexia and Beta are walking down the stairs. They begin to have a conversation about the cult and Lord Perv. They believe Lord Perv is a member of the court and they know a lot of people must be aware of this but all of them do not have strong evidence against him. Alexia tells Beta of how her father has warned her not to mess with the divine teachings. They also discuss the King of Oriana and how his daughter embarrassed him by killing her fiancé and running away. Beta then asks Alexia where the stairs lead to and she answers that they lead to an entrance to the royal capital underground entrances. Alexia explains that the maps and codes to the stairs are all lost, so the stairs have become a giant maze. Beta then asks why they are heading towards the passages and Alexia answers that it is to dispose of Beta's body. Seeing that she did not react, Alexia tells Beta that she is joking and she is surprised as Beta is not scared. After listening to Alexia saying that she is not scared, Beta decides to scream that she should not kill her. Alexia begins to tell Beta that it is possible that Rose has escaped into the underground passages, and they are there to look for her. Beta asks her if she has told anyone about going to the underground passage and she scolds her for dragging her into it. Princess Rose sits on the ground injured as she leans her bloody sword beside her. Then, she begins to gasp for air as she becomes weak and reminisces about what has happened. She asks herself what else she could have done and remembers how she saw the state her father was and how she became angry and attacked her fiancé. She recollects how the guards chased her and how she escaped from them. She consoles herself that she had done the right thing and she had no choice but to save herself. Rose begins to blame herself and tells herself that she has put her homeland in trouble. She begins to list ways they can avoid wars. She also thinks of turning herself in. She also remembers Sid and wonders if he has heard what happened to her, and also wonders if he believes in her. Princess Rose begins to tell herself that she wishes she could eliminate Lord Perv and his ilk so she can save her father and marry Sid in order to live happily ever after. She then scolds herself for thinking that the world is like fairy tales. The wound in her chest begins to hurt more and she yells in pain and just as she is about to pass out due to a lot of pain in her chest, she begins to hear the Moonlight Sonata and traces the sound. Soon she sees Lord Shadow playing the piano and he asks her if she wants to fight for her people. She tells him that she wishes to fight back and conquer the enemies after her homeland. Also, she tells him how she wishes to protect her father and her people from the members of the cult. Shadow then tells Princess Rose that if she wishes to fight, he is ready to give her powers. Immediately, Lord Shadow first heals her with his power and Princess Rose becomes surprised at the way her chest healed up at once. Next, he gives her powers and she begins to ask herself what was flowing through her. She releases herself to be filled with the power and soon she becomes powerful. Before vanishing, Lord Shadow tells her to make sure she takes revenge on the people that are planning to take her kingdom, and, after advising her, the eminence in Shadow suddenly vanishes. Soon, some members of the Cult of Diablos attack her and she uses the magic Lord Shadow has just given her to defeat them all. Princess Rose begins to head up the stairs and soon she meets Alexia and Beta on the way. Alexia begins to ask her why she stabbed her fiancé. She also asks her what the outburst of magic energy they felt was. Princess Rose tells them that she has obtained power. Princess Rose apologizes to Alexia and tells her that she does not want to drag her into it. Alexia begins to yell at Rose to tell her but she insists that if she tells her, she will be dragged into it. Immediately, Alexia begins to remind Rose of the promise they made to each other in the sanctuary when they were still young. Rose tells her gently that she does not want to lose her friend as people would start seeing her as an evil and bad one. Alexia suddenly becomes very furious and throws the lamp in her hand away as she takes out her sword to attack Princess Rose. She tells Princess Rose that she is going to force answers out of her since she does not want to answer easily. Immediately, Rose blocks her attack and they begin to fight. Princess Alexia tells Princess Rose that she is not a spectator anymore. They continue to use their magical powers and their swords to fight. Beta picks up the lamp Alexia drops and she immediately blocks the large rush of energy coming to hit her. Princess Rose carries Princess Alexia in her arms and begins to wonder how and when she got strong in order to attack her. She drops Princess Alexia with Beta and apologizes to her that she has to go. Beta then tells Princess Rose that she cannot stop her as she does not have the right to stop her. She also tells Princess Rose that their alliance was not a bad idea. She wishes Princess Rose success and tells her that she knows they will meet again. After this, Princess Rose runs up the stairs and Beta begins to wonder if she is the person Lord Shadow has chosen. Sid begins to walk back to his house as he appreciates the beautiful tune of the piano. He recollects how he heard Epistolin play the piano and how beautiful it sounded to him. He wishes that he had his own instead of having to borrow it. While thinking, he is suddenly stopped by a girl who stands in front of him and as he looks up, he sees that it is his sister. He immediately smiles at her and greets her. In his apartment, Sid's sister sits with him on his bed and surprisingly, she begins to strangle him. She asks him if he knows what she was thinking about while waiting for him in front of his door. 
He tells her that he does not know. She tightens her hands around his neck and tells him that while waiting for him, she has been beating him into a bloody pulp in her mind. She tells him that she keeps beating him over again in her mind and as she stands to wait for him, her rage increases. Sid says to himself that he just learnt that some anger increases with time. She then tells him that she knows he is thinking that he does not care, and as he is about to answer her that it is not true, she tightens her hand more on his neck. She then asks him if he wants to experience how long humans can hold their breath before dying. Sid then faintly tells his sister that when a person is strangled, they pass out because their carotid artery is blocked and it has nothing to do with breathing. This time, saliva begins to drool out of Sid's mouth. His sister then tells him that he had promised her that they would go home together during the summer holidays. Sid asks if it is true and she tells him that he has always behaved as if all of his promises to her meant nothing to him. So he ends up breaking those promises. Sid tells her that he will try to become a new person. Immediately, she removes one of her hands and he is able to breathe. Then, she tells him he has one last chance. He asks her what she is talking about and immediately she shows him seat tickets to the Bushin Festival. She tells him that it is impossible to get one and she also instructs him to go to the festival to go and watch the fights and learn. Sid asks her if she is not sitting the festival out and she tells him that she has been chosen to represent the academy in place of Princess Rose. She tightens her hand once again and asks him if he was not aware of that before and immediately Sid tells her that he was aware, and he was just asking to check. Sid's sister then warns him that if he wants to live long, he should stop neglecting his elder sister. She tells him that she is going to be the champion and he must be there to see it. After releasing his neck, Sid begins to vomit and he begins to scream. Princess Alexia and Beta come to the apartment and Beta asks if Princess Iris has packed out. Princess Alexia tells her that she has packed and moved abroad as she said she would be spending a while abroad to do some research. Beta goes out and Alexia sees a sheet of paper on the desk. She takes it and reads it out loud. She says her sister drops clues for her every time as she notices that the note is about sword fighting. At that moment, she hears a loud sound coming from outside the apartment. She notices that it is the noise of fireworks. She says to herself that she does not need anybody's pity as she herself does not pity herself anymore. The fireworks become full in the stadium as people are excited and getting ready for the Bushin Festival. Sid comes into the tournament and he is asked to submit his sword, he is dressed gloriously, and he begins to find a seat for himself. He notices that he is in the VIP section. He begins to regret not wearing his uniform on the occasion. He reaches a seat and sees a girl who asks him what his name is and he introduces himself humbly and bows as he tells the girl that he is in the wrong seat. She mentions his surname and tells him that he must be Clara's sister. She tells him of her plan to add his sister to her order once she graduates. Sid becomes surprised, as she knows his sister. The girl tells him that he is in the right seat as she knows that his sister must have given him her ticket. Sid takes his seat and the girl tells Sid that she owes him an apology for the trouble she caused him during the Xenon Griffery incident. But Sid politely tells her that it is okay, and she should not worry about it. The girl tells Sid that they have already ended talks about settling the matter between the royal family and that of the Marquess. Iris also adds that, as she is Princess Alexia's sister, she apologizes to him. This makes the students sitting beside them surprised. Sid begins to think that the named character is apologizing to him. He feels that is the worst thing about his background character's persona. Princess Iris continues, asking Sid if the incident did not affect his friendship with Alexia, her sister. But Sid tells her that he only picked up the coins she tossed at him. Princess Iris does not understand and Sid explains to her how he and Princess Alexia would play fetch together. He then remembers how Princess Alexia would make him dress up like a dog and she would throw sticks and tell him to go and pick them up with his mouth. Iris tells Sid about how Princess Alexia is supposed to come for the tournament but she cancels at the last minute. A student asks Iris which player she has her eyes on and she tells them it is Anaros. She also tells them that she has watched her fight and she knows she is a traveler who is learning skills on pilgrimage. She also adds that it is her first time in the tournament. The students sitting beside Princess Iris begin to argue that Anaros will defeat Princess Iris. Hearing this, she tells them that they should not worry as she will win the tournament and the fate of the Bushin method lies in her hand and she will do her best to make sure she protects the pride of her homeland and that of her people. Sid asks if there are any other fighter worth watching and this makes the two students see Sid very well. They tell each other that he is Alexia's boyfriend. Immediately, Princess Iris introduces Sid to them as Claire's brother. The students begin to commend him sarcastically. They tell him he is not like his sister. They advise him to take things slowly and he should not think of any funny ideas of marrying into power. Sid tells them of a fighter, mundane man. They say he is not a main tournament material. Princess Iris says she has not seen any of his matches. A student tells her that he is not a big deal as he is a very weak fighter, and his only strong area is his speed. The students then tell Princess Iris that he is no match for Anaros, 
who is a skilled fighter. They all discuss another fighter, Lady Beatrix. Princess Iris tells them that she is an elf sword master who is hailed as the war goddess. She tells them that Lady Beatrix was the first champion of the Bushin Festival, and she is present in the capital. Sid begins to wonder why he did not know that Lady Beatrix was so popular. He stands up and begins to walk away. Princess Iris asks him where he is going to and he tells her that he wants to go and powder his nose. As Sid begins to walk through the halls, he begins to hear footsteps and he tells himself that someone strong is nearby. Suddenly, someone calls him from behind and as he turns to look, he sees that it is Lady Beatrix. She asks him if he was avoiding her and he says no. She also asks him if he has seen an elf like her since they last met and he said he has not seen an elf like her. They both discuss the tournament and soon they exchange gifts and they bid each other farewell. Meanwhile, Lord Perv comes to sit with Princess Iris and she tells him that the seats are reserved for students, but he tells her that the students would learn a lot by seeing him talk to her in public. He begins to tease her and she tells him that he is already engaged to be married, but he tells her that he and his fiancé are in the middle of a fight and he is sure she will come back to him. Lord Perv also informs Princess Iris that the king is unable to attend but he will attend the fights happening the following day. He also asks if her own father, King Klaus, is also absent and she tells him that he will also be attending the following day. Meanwhile, Lord Perv tells Princess Iris that it is such a coincidence that both kings did not come to watch the fight the same day. He also notices Anna Rose and tells Iris of his intentions in inviting her to fight for his kingdom. Princess Iris also tells Lord Perv that she has already had her eyes on Anna Rose and she is planning on telling her to fight for her own country. Lord Perv then tells her that Midgar, her homeland, already has dark knights that can protect the kingdom. Princess Iris tells Lord Perv Ashat about the confidence she sees in Mundane Man, even though he is a very weak fighter, and he tells her that he does not know anything about swordplay. Soon the fight begins and Anna Rose begins to think about how she can defeat Mundane Man. She thinks she can outrun him, but she is surprised at how fast he is. Anna Rose begins to think of how she would attack him and while she waits, he attacks her and defeats her. Lord Perv Ashat tells Princess Iris that her instincts were right. They begin to discuss how he put his skills into use. They evaluate him and Lord Perv asks Princess Iris if she will be going against Mundane Man in the next round and she says yes. He also asks if she is confident of defeating him and she tells him that it is not beauty that determines a duel. She also tells Lord Perv Ashat that Mundane Man is too weak and, even though he has defeated Anna Rose, he only has speed and he is not yet her level. Princess Iris then tells Lord Perv Ashat that she does not like to lose, so Mundane Man cannot defeat her. She excuses herself and tells Lord Perv that she wants to go and prepare for the fight. While leaving, Lord Perv Ashat tells his servant to find where Mundane Man is from. He tells his servant that he suspects he is from the underworld, and if the lawless city is backing him, things could get difficult. Anna Rose calls Mundane Man as he walks through the halls. She tells him that she accepts defeat and she thinks she has improved in her skills. They both shake hands and he turns to go away. Immediately, Anna Rose asks him who he really is and he tells her that he is just a fool who abandoned everything in pursuit of strength. Anna Rose then tells Mundane Man that if he fights well he can be called to defend a country, and he would be in the spotlight and people would really see him as the strong fighter that he is but he turns and tells her that he is not ready for that kind of flashy lifestyle. Princess Iris wins her first match by using a magical skill to hit her opponent very hard and this causes a great effect on the field. Immediately, she finishes fighting and suddenly she sees Lady Beatrix and begins to run after her. She stops her and asks her if she is Beatrix the War Goddess, and Lady Beatrix asks who she is. Princess Iris then introduces herself as the Princess of Midgar. Lady Beatrix then tells Princess Iris that once she eats she will be okay and she offers her some bread. But Princess Iris politely refuses, while standing looking confused. While walking home, Sid begins to recount how he is able to use his sword skills he cannot use as a shadow. He also managed to accomplish 70% of his Bushin festival goals. He tells himself that he needs to figure out how to finish it. He says that the simple solution would be to win the whole thing, but he thinks his most climatic scene is going to be his next battle with Princess Iris. He wants to defeat the princess and just disappear. He began to think that he would beat someone that everyone has identified as a powerful warrior and he would then say his work is done, as he would now be banished like a true eminence in shadow. He also imagines what it would be like if he went down the evil way. He also tells himself that there are tons of awesome paths to take. Suddenly, he hears a voice telling him that he seems happy, and he replies that he looks happy, and as he looks he sees that it is his elder sister. She asks him if he had fun watching her match and immediately, he says he is dead as he completely forgot about her match. After watching Princess Iris take down the commander with one blow, the other knights are very impressed. Some on them were however not surprised at this as they believed she possessed extraordinary talent. After the fight, Princess Iris walks away, and is reminded of a time when she was referred to as the pride of the Royal Bushin Method. Some even whispered that with her on their side, Midgar would always be safe. Eventually, she was told that the local citizens can handle order in their region 
discouraging her from traveling all the way there to help them, especially since this will not take work away from the Dark Knight Association. Due to this, she is urged to leave this and focus on more important things which she can accomplish. Later on, when she joined the Knights, the people are thrilled and admire her while she rides past them. They refer to her as the pride of Midgar Kingdom. While all this happened, Princess Iris had felt pressured and tried all she could do to control herself. All of this bottled up emotions led to her finish the commander off with a blow. She had been angry with angry with him for telling her to be a good member of the audience and do nothing. While she lets states how she feels to him, he assures her that even she is powerless against the enemy if they can't use magic. When she met her father regarding thus, demanding to be given a chance to invoke the royal authority, he asks her to be cautious. This is since, acting impetuously will only create an excess of enemies. He lets her know that even if what she is doing is right, there is no guarantee that those who do not know about the circumstances will understand that it is right. Also, since the Bushin Festival, a time which they welcome many guests, is approaching, he is cautious about presenting the nation as standing in opposition to the divine teachings. All these still do not seem to bother Princess Iris who remains determined to go after the enemy, but her father only assumes that she is desperate to prove herself right. He believes that her actions will put the kingdom in danger. All these had prompted her to aim at getting results and prove that she has the power to do so. Meanwhile, in preparation of the festival, there is a banquet and Vid happened to be invited. He is thrilled at how much comfort comes with a VVIP invite, commending the fact that he can ask the maids for anything and be sure to be answered, free of charge. While sipping his coffee, his thoughts are interrupted by Princess Iris. She asks if he had come to cheer for his sister, Claire, again. This, he confirms. While he wonders why she has come to sit beside him again, she states that she has been released from official duties for the day. Just then, she realizes that he is drinking coffee, and commends its smell. However, she doesn't like the bitter flavor. As a solution, Sid asks if she has trued pudding in milk and sugar, which would turn it into coffee milk. While she finds this hard to believe, he tells her that it's a magic spell that will make every kind of coffee taste exactly the same. When Princess Iris naively attempts this, her coffee turns out to be delicious. While they eat, Sid is happy that he gets to have an elegant breakfast with the princess, and believes this will go viral on the internet. Shortly after, there is a slight commotion, as the guards prevent a lady from entering with her sword. Seeing her from afar, Sid seems to recognize her. While the guards continue to insist that she keeps her sword, Princess Iris arrives, informing them that she invited her. Then, she reveals her name as Beatrix, the war goddess. Hearing this, the men are shocked to their bones. This is because they now recognize her as the legendary sword master. Hearing this, Cod is thrilled. He imagines being referred to as a legendary master. Meanwhile, Princess Iris leads Beatrix to a chair close to her, and this makes Sid uncomfortable. He wonders why the two women have chosen to sit close to him. On the other hand, the other men begin to ask Lady Beatrix multiple questions. One of them seeks to seeks to know why she hasn't appeared in public in a while, wondering why she has chosen to do so now. In response, she states that she is looking for someone. That person happens to be her niece who looks very much like her. Then, she asks if any of them have seen her. Instead of just answering the question, they begin to flirt with her, stating that they would never forget the face of anyone who looked as beautiful as her. Happy. Get some help. Hearing this, she is reminded of a claim that the people have seen elves in the kingdom, but the men state that they haven't seen any. Hearing this, Princess Iris apologizes to Beatrix. Apparently, she had brought her here hoping she would find her lost niece, but unfortunately it wasn't helpful. On a lighter mood, the men ask her if there is any competitor who has caught her attention, and she surprisingly replies with the name, Sid. This gets numerous echoes from people around as they wonder why. In response, she states that she is sure he will grow stronger, even though he doesn't think he would. One of the knights verify his claim, stating that, although he is a student at the academy, he doesn't seem fit to be knight material, and doesn't even compare to his sister, Claire Cajnu. To ease the tension, Princess Iris believes that if Beatrix thinks that way, she must be right. In agreement, the others look forward to Sid's future. However, they are left wondering how someone as clueless as Beatrix is the was goddess. Since she is Princess Iris' guest, they are forced to believe. On the other hand, Sid believes otherwise. He thinks Beatrix definitely has what it takes to be called a war goddess. This is because, her looks, personality, title and strength is perfectly natural and unembellished. All this makes it hard for anyone to see how powerful she is. Meanwhile, Lord Perv feeds Princess Rose's father with his daily dose of drugs. While he has no complaints about the efficacy of the drug, he is disturbed at how much it makes the king stink. Due to this, he orders the guard to cover the king up with some perfume. After that, he expresses his happiness with how the drug has made the king his puppet that can only do as he has commanded. This makes him feel pity for the king. However, he feels assured that the king's daughter, Princess Rose, will come back to save her pitiful father. Hearing his daughter's name, the king struggles to call it out. 
However, Lord Perf says he wouldn't have minded letting Rose roam free if she had been a good girl and handed him the keys, although he is unbothered since she has begun to show symptoms of possession, which had made her a prime material for the cult of Diablo's experimentation. After that, he leads the sick king to the throne room. As they walk there, he remains confident that the princess would not appear, making it easy for him to use the king's influence to slay the king of Midgar. This is in hopes of sparking a war between the two kingdoms of Midgar and Oriana, eventually leading to the destruction of the latter. Even though this would affect his current status, he doesn't seem to care. Apparently, he has made arrangements to install a puppet leader as the next king of Midgar. Due to this, he is assured he will get the highest chance of success executing his plan during Princess Iris match. This would however, be a problem since the princess is set to face a fighter named, the Mundane Man. Lord Perv had looked into this man's background and found nothing. This makes the Lord believe that the Mundane Man is a resident of the underworld which puts him in a very dangerous position. Ho wonders what purpose the mundane man has to come out and fight. However, since he has deployed a large number of soldiers around the kingdom, he is relaxed. This is slightly tainted by his worry about Shadow Garden, as he wonders how they will react to his plans. He feels they are working with Princess Rose, and this is bothersome. Shockingly, his thoughts are interrupted by Lady Beatrix who states that the king stinks. Angrily, Lord Perv orders the guards to remove her. Immediately, Princess Iris steps in. She informs Lord Perv that the woman is her invited guest and in fact, Beatrix, the war goddess. Hearing this, Lord Perv is shocked. He recognizes Beatrix as the woman who may have awakened the hero's blood with it. After being introduced, Beatrix apologizes to him, but he apologizes in return, claiming to not have known who she was. Although he doesn't see this as an excuse, and urges her to relax and enjoy the Bushin festival. With everything in place, Lord Perv wonders what the war goddess would be doing in this tournament of all places. So that she doesn't spoil his plans, he plans to look for an opportunity to eliminate her. However, this will not be easy for him, as she is even better with a sword than Princess Iris who is rumored to be the best. Due to this, he wonders if it will be possible to assassinate the King of Midgar as he had planned. On the bright side, he is confident that it will, as long as Princess Rose appears. If this happens, he plans to capture her and proceeds with the war against Oriana as planned. While there keeps being reasons in his kind for the princess to be absent, he is sure that she will come. In a distance, he sees a young man sneaking out. Looking closely, it happens to be Sid going to ease himself. Seeing this, he doesn't seem to care. This is because he has no reason to be envious of the masses. Watching Claire Cage new fight, he is impressed by how exceptional she is. Although he acknowledges that she has potential, she doesn't seem like a threat to him. However, he thinks that things will be much easier for him if everyone was at Claire's level. Shortly after, Claire wins her match and Princess Iris gets ready for her. While heading to the arena, everyone keeps putting pressure on her, by calling her name and telling her to win. The continuous voices of the people give her the strength she needs. Most especially, hearing the people says that the kingdom will be safe as long as they have her, Princess Iris is determined to make them keep thinking that. However, for that to be possible, she has to win this match. Although, standing face to face with her opponent, the mundane man, she can't seem to sense an iota of strength from him. However, she believes there is something unfathomable about him. Even with this, she is confident that she can defeat him as soon as the match begins, as long as she gives it everything she has got. Even though she knows that he is hiding something, she doesn't know what it is. However, she is determined not to give him a second to reveal it, and finish this with one blow. That being said, the announcer announces the second fight between Princess Iris and Mundane Man. Just as he begins the fight, Princess Iris has her head cut off. Fortunately, this is a hallucination, and it scares the hell out of her, causing her to retreat far from the Mundane Man. Since he is so far from her, she wonders how he was able to cut her. However, he, who hasn't even lifted a finger, seeks to know why she is not attacking. Looking around, she realizes that she backed away from him when the fight had just began. This is because she had senses her death. Disregarding this, she gets up and unsheathes her sword. At this moment, she is determined to go up against him, since letting him sense her fear would make him seem more powerful. However, just as she gets ready to attack, she feels her leg being cut off. This gets her wondering if it was an illusion of if he actually got close to her. This causes her to realize that the entire arena is in his striking range. While this is going on, a girl arrives in disguise as she approaches the VIP area, where the king and other nobles are seated. She is, however, surprised to see no security guards. Instead, she sees the dead bodies of some members of the Cult of Diablos and some tied-up citizens. Looking around, she sees the Shadow Sisters, 
who recognize her instantly. They tell her to proceed with fulfilling her mission. At that moment, she removes her disguise and it is revealed that she is Princess Rose. On the other hand, Princess Iris continues her fight with the mundane man and continues to see illusions of him cutting her, while he remains standing on a spot. Eventually, she realizes that he is doing this with his eyes and a slight change in his center of gravity, which has made her hallucinate. This lower, she thinks, makes him very powerful. While she figures out how to defeat him, the crowd begins to lose hope in her, with some thinking she is afraid. To prove them wrong, she charges powerfully at him, ready to strike him down. When she approaches him, she realizes that he has no sword in his hand, and it was all an illusion. However, it is too late, as he dodges her attack and grabs her neck, bring her to the ground. Just before unsheathing his sword and stating that they are just getting started. Watching her lose the fight, Lord Perv is angry that she would lose to someone like him. Although he is thrilled at the mundane man's power, and admits that not even his darkest knight would possess such a power. At this moment, Princess Rose walks into the hall. Seeing her, Lord Perv is happy. Seeing her, the sick king is happy and urges her to come closer. On the other hand, the princess claims she has come to apologize for everything she has done and is about to do. As the princess, she seeks permission to follow the laugh that she believes in. Hearing her say this, the king forgives her all her sins. This gets Lord Perv angry, as he hadn't instructed his puppet king to say that. Having received her father's forgiveness, the princess springs up to attack Lord Perv. In the blink of an eye, he uses the king as a shield, and the princess is led to kill her own father. As a final act of service, she decides to kill herself. Just as she is about to do so, Lord Perv orders the guards to stop her. In that moment, Lord Shadow arrives, in the form of the mundane man, wiping them out. At that moment, his true identity is revealed. However, the naive princess refers to him as the stylish bandit slayer. Apparently, she had encountered him when she was much younger and he had inspired her to be a fencer. She commends him for continuing the fight for evil, even at that age. However, she is disappointed in herself for attempting to give up. At this point, he asks her to raise her head since her fight has not ended yet. Looking at her father's lifeless body, she is determined to fight on. Just then, she escapes. Watching her leave, Lord Perv gets angry. He trues to follow her but he is stopped by Lord Shadow. Due to this, he calls out for his guards, but they have already been wiped out by the girls of Shadow Garden. In a brief moment, Beatrix attacks Lord Shadow. Seizing the opportunity, Lord Perv escapes. While Beatrix attacks Lord Shadow, Princess Iris is very angry. This is more because she had realized that the mundane man she fought was actually Lord Shadow in disguise. The explosion caused by the collision of Lord Shadow and Beatrix's blade causes the citizens to panic. The King of Migger gets informs that the guests of honor have been taken to a safe place. However, he doubts that the fight will remain in the confines of the stadium. Due to this, he considers declaring martial law. Just then, he asks about Lord Perv, who at this time was on the run. The King's Guard informs him that Lord Perv could be heading for Oriana Kingdom with no plan of stopping at the embassy. When asked about the body of the King of Oriana, he is informed that it is safely in their custody. Hearing this, he asks them to treat it with care and respect. Also, he orders them to throw Mark West Grant while returning to Oriana. Meanwhile, the fight between Lord Shadow and Beatrix continues. The two seem to almost be at the same level in their sword mastery. However, Lord Shadow shows that he is above her by pulling off surprise attacks, causing her to be worried. His movement is so fast that she finds it hard to notice when he moves. When she blurts out her worries, he states that they are just getting started. Suddenly, Princess Iris arrives, seeking a chance to join the fight. Just then, she unsheathes a mithril blade with ancient runes. Seeing what seemed like his worried face, Princess Iris asks Lord Shadow if he thinks the sword is underhanded. Surprisingly, he claims it isn't, and mocks her for leaning onto the sword for a win. This gets her very angry and she demands that he shut up. Then, she attempts to strike him with the sword, but he dodges her attacks effortlessly. At this point, he gets attacks by Beatrix too, putting him up against the two powerful ladies at the same time. While this is going on, Princess Rose eventually escapes the palace. However, she is left wondering where she would go from here. She considers going back to the royal capital, amidst thoughts of joining the anti-perv resistance. Just then, she is met by Lady Alpha who offers her two choices. In the meantime, Lord Shadow continues to resist the attacks of the two girls. While fighting, it seems like he is joking with them, as he acts like he isn't putting in much effort. When Princess Iris unleashes an attack, he states that she has real potential. They take the fight from the skies to the side of buildings and now land on the top of a train. There, advises them not to fall off as they continue the fight. Meanwhile, Princess Rose seeks to know what the two choices are. At that moment, Lady Alpha reveals that it is first that she continues her fight alone. Secondly, is that she has a chance to fight by their side on Shadow Garden. Having heard the two choices, Princess Rose is left with a question. She seeks to know if the Shadow Garden has any intention of saving Oriana Kingdom. In response, Lady Alpha assures her that they would do nothing to assist her as she currently is, but states that the only way to save her kingdom is to show them her worth, 
and the worth of the Oriana Kingdom. Hearing this, she wonders if the Oriana Kingdom can be saved. But Lord Alpha lets her know that it depends on her. After a brief moment of contemplation, she pledges to fight alongside them. On the other hand, in the heat of battle, Princess Iris seeks to know who Lord Shadow truly is. But, he states that he is Shadow, and the name and form are his truth. This answer angers her even further. Beatrix, on the other hand, introduces herself to him, and seeks to know if they have met before. In response, she states that he never forgets a powerful opponent. This makes him ask them if they are worth keeping in his memory. Just then, he unleashes a fire attack on them, and the two are forced to dodge. While feeling disappointed about how badly magic flows through ordinary water, Princess Iris tries to pull off a surprise attack. But he dodges it and punches her into the water. While fighting Beatrix, she ends up cutting his weapon in half. The two continue their heated battle around the city, and when Lord Shadow tries a surprise attack on her, she blocks it, stating that she had gotten used to his trick now. On hearing this, he is impressed at her sword skill but believes that her use of magic leaves much to be desired. Just then, he intends to show her what true magic feels like. Fortunately for her, Princess Iris comes charging, interrupting his intended attack. After successfully avoiding Princess Iris' attack, he lets her know that he cannot be defeated with borrowed strength. Since going up against him one-on-one -on -one hasn't worked so far, the two girls decide to attack as a team. While Princess Iris immobilizes him, she urges Lady Beatrix to take him down. Just then, the two charges at him, causing a slight scare. However, he overpowers them, bring them to the ground and stepping on their bodies. Even after being severely beaten, Princess Iris regains her strength. She blames Lord Shadow for wrecking havoc throughout the capital. She informs him that everyone in the kingdom of Midgar is now his enemy, leaving him with nowhere to run. Hearing her say this, Lord Shadow is laughs loudly. The fact that she thought G would be on the run makes him feel offended. Due to this, he unleashes a large boundary around the city declaring that playtime is over. Just then, he demands that they observe what he refers to as his earth-shattering, sky-rending, supremely ultimate, almighty and unparalleled attack. At that moment, he builds up enough suspense that gets them scared, after which, he disappears. Looking up, the two girls see a clear sky and no trace of Lord Shadow. Realizing this, Princess Iris screams in pain. She feels very disappointed for not catching him. Later on, Lord Perv is scolded by the leader of the Cult of Diablos. While he apologizes, he assures them that as long as the royal family is in the cult's clutches, Princess Rose cannot disappear without a trace. Furthermore, he believes that the kingdom of Oriana will be in turmoil, now that they have lost their king. Due to this, he is confident that the princess will surely come back. Hearing this, the leader is left with no choice but to believe him. Amidst all this, the citizens are devastated and intend to leave the kingdom. One of those citizens happened to be Lady Beatrix. Before leaving, she advises Princess Iris not to obsess over Lord Shadow. In response, Princess Iris states that she isn't capable of staying still for too long. Meanwhile, the other sisters are worried that the Night Order are in search of Lord Shadow. However, they are informed that he is using himself as a decoy to distract the Midgar Kingdom. This is in order to keep them from trouble with the Oriana Kingdom. Seeking to know if they are in full communication with the others, they are relaxed after being told that Lady Etia is working things out. With this, they are determined to do their best work ever for Lord Shadow, especially since all the necessary preparations are complete for this and their public engagement. Since Lord Shadow has Bo become actively involved, the sisters are left with the responsibility of tying up loose ends. They intend to send more personnel to investigate the lawless city. Later on, Lord Shadow takes his true form as Sid, taking the bus to school. There, he asks his friend about Skell. Apparently, Skell had told them he was taking a long-term job. This bothers Sid because the new school term had just started. Skell, on the other hand, is left praying and hoping for a chance to get back to land after getting a job as a fisherman. After being told by his friend about what had happened in the city after the arrival of Lord Shadow, Sid comes to the conclusion that he should keep things more in the shadow from now on. Shortly after, Princess Rose finds herself in the cage new compound. Apparently, she was waiting for Lady Alpha, who eventually comes to inform her that they would continue their journey from here and by foot. She hopes that they would be able to make it to their destination by nightfall. The two walk through mountains and deeper into the woods. Hearing about what area they intend to pass, Princess Rose is scared. She seeks to know if magical beasts do not infest the region anymore. In response, Lady Alpha tells her about how Lord Shadow fought and defeated the Mist Dragon, which led him to be dubbed ruler of the realm. Arriving at their destination, Princess Rose is shocked to find out that it is the ancient capital, Alexandria. This happens to be their base of operation. When they get there, Lady Alpha introduces her to another sister named Lambda, informing the latter that they have a new recruit, and instructing her to train Princess Rose. Just then, she lets Princess Rose know that the rest depends on her, urging her to show them what she is worth. Without wasting much time, Lambda puts her in a squad and names her number 666. This is before stripping her of her clothes and everything she holds dear. 
When this is done, she is told that she is nothing and a nobody, and asked to cast away everything about the life she knew. At that moment, thoughts of Sid flood her mind. Even that is shred by Lambda, who is insistent that she casts everything away. On the bright side, after all that had happened, Lord Shadow spends his time playing the piano, and is convinced that he has achieved his purpose. He acknowledges lurking in the darkness to do what must be done, prepared for the time of awakening which is now at hand. If you like this recap, do let me know in the comments, and obviously leave your like too. Do not forget to share with your friends and subscribe. Above all, activate your notification bell so you don't miss the next episode when it drops. Until next time, do take care and stay safe.